Uh, good morning and, and welcome everyone to the 22nd meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format for MSPs, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. So that's what you're doing if you see us using our phones or our, or, or our tablets. Uh, full house today by MSPs. No apologies have been received. I'm going to move to agenda item one, building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. And the committee will take evidence on the scrutiny of building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. And, well, and doing so, can I welcome John Wood, Policy Manager, Communities Team Cosla, Michael Thane, Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers, David Aiken and Alan McCauley, Local Authority Building Standards Scotland, and Raymond Barlow, Assistant Head of Planning and Building Standards Glasgow City Council. Thank you everyone for, for coming along. I do believe we've got a number of opening statements, so I'll just take them in the order that's been provided to me. So can we get uh, John for the first opening statement? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, so as the committee will be aware, COSLA is a membership organisation representing all 32 Scottish local authorities. We welcome the committee turning its attention to building standards and fire safety in the wake of the Grenfell tragedy. And we'd like to place on record our sympathy for every member of the community affected by the fire at Grenfell Tower. At their meeting on the 25th of August, COSLA leaders asked me to convey this message uh, to you, to the committee. COSLA's focus in the weeks following the Grenfell tragedy has been on supporting the work undertaken by the Scottish Government, including the Ministerial Working Group and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, to gather relevant information at a national level and support reassurance activity at a local level. We welcome the creation of the Ministerial Working Group and have found the communicative approach of that group to be particularly helpful. From what COSLA can understand, three key policy developments have occurred at a national level in Scotland over the summer. Firstly, the Ministerial Working Group has agreed to bring forward a consultation on the regulation of smoke and fire alarms in homes for social rent. Secondly, the Ministerial Working Group has endorsed a fire safety campaign which will be led by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and supported by a number of other organisations, including COSLA. Finally, the Ministerial Working Group's commitment to reviewing relevant standards and regulations is being undertaken. COSLA welcomes each of these developments. It has also been reassuring to learn through the group's information, through the group's information gathering exercise that no council housing tower block has been covered with a combustible cladding material of the sort suspected to have been used at Genfield Tower. Turning to the response of local authorities, our members' primary focus has been on reassuring the public, particularly the communities who live in high-rise domestic properties. Our understanding is that councils and the fire service have worked extremely well to reassure tenants and that their early and comprehensive response should be commended. COSA believes that a holistic approach to fire prevention should be taken and that building standards only forms part of this picture, albeit an important part of this picture. In terms of today's evidence session, I hope I can provide a helpful insight into some of the national conversations that have been happening and on local authorities' broad view on fire safety and domestic properties. While colleagues from Labs and Alacho will be able to provide a more comprehensive level of technical detail than I can, I hope my contributions can be of value to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr Wood. Uh, that's helpful. Uh, can I move to uh, David Aiken, please? Uh, my name is uh, Dave Aitken, I'm the current chair of Local Authority uh, Building Standards Scotland and on behalf of LABS as we're commonly known, known we welcome the opportunity to, to attend the meeting uh, with specific regard to the topic of building regulations and fire safety. Uh, having attended a previous meeting on the, the wider building standards system, the, the committee may be aware that LABS represents the interests of all the, the 32 local authority building standards services in Scotland. Uh, we hope the specific skills and qualifications and, and experiences um, of those uh, representing LABS today will assist the committee in undertaking its scrutiny of uh, building regulations and, and fire safety. Acting solely in the, in the public interest, we work closely with the Scottish Government's Building Standards Division uh, on procedural and technical matters related to the building standards system in Scotland. And the primary aim is to, to ensure that the verification and enforcement uh, is undertaken as effectively as possible. Um, my day job, I'm the team leader of building standards within Dundee City Council. I'm a chartered building standards surveyor. Uh, and I'm accompanied today with uh, Alan McCauley, who's also a team leader of building standards service at South Lanarkshire Council. Alan is a, a chartered surveyor, past chair of uh, labs, 
and also uh, also has a fire engineering degree. So, thank you. Much. And uh, Raymond Barlow, I believe you've got a contribution for the committee as well. Yes, yeah. I just uh, thank you. Just a short statement. I, I didn't obviously provide uh, a written submission uh, to the committee. Um, I was aware of the lab submission. I'm also a past chair of labs in 2014-15, so I, I simply welcome the, the ability to contribute today. I, I'm the assistant head of planning and building standards at Glasgow City Council. With over 30 years' experience in the building standards field, like Alan, I'm a chartered surveyor. Of a degree in fire risk engineering. We obviously see much of that type of uh, approach uh, in the city of Glasgow uh, with the nature of the developments we see. So I'm, I'm just, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to anything I can to today's committee. Okay. Uh, thanks uh, for, for those opening statements. Um, if I could perhaps kick off before I move, move to fellow members. Um, the good news, I suppose, if there's any good news from the, the tragedy of Grenfell, is it would appear, and I, I stress, it would appear that uh, no high rise in Scotland has the combustible material or the systems that were discovered at Grenfell that led to that, that dreadful tragedy. I know confirmation has been given by housing associations and local authorities to the Scottish Government that is indeed the case. But can I just get a little bit more information as how do you know that? So, because like constituents of mine will say that that's brilliant, we've got those reassurances, but how can this be stated with certainty? So maybe uh, a little bit more information how this can be stated with such certainty that those materials don't exist in, in the housing stock in your areas. So who would like to start with that? I think, Raymond, do you want to take this given the, the amount of high rise you have in Glasgow? Yeah, um, we uh, have just recently completed our uh, submission um, back to the ministers and we're waiting some further feedback. So I'm not therefore sure whether the information you have is fully up to date. Um, and I, I don't necessarily want to go into the detail of what I've given over. Glasgow responded previously with regards to the social uh, landlords within the city. Um, our, as you know, Glasgow doesn't carry its own uh, uh, council housing anymore. So our housing associations, our links with the housing associations and the weekly group in particular, we uh, went to them and asked them to report back to us and we responded on that initially and there were no properties uh, reported on that tranche. Now, that would have been very much based on the records of how they had reclad their buildings. And uh, you know, a lot of, you know, most of which would have had building warrants. So we went to them on that. What we've been doing is completing the exercise for uh, flatter developments, which are uh, uh, private flatter developments. And it's been a very, very difficult exercise to try and ascertain which buildings fell into, firstly, the category uh, or in the height criteria. Uh, and then secondly, once we established that, to then go to whatever records were available to us, which initially is obviously building warrant records. Uh, we had some feedback from factors, uh, which followed on from the request of the ministers. So we've only recently completed um, that exercise and we've notified some properties back to the ministers and we're awaiting further feedback. Uh, before I go to yourself, Mr. Thane, just uh, Mr. Barlow, I think we have to just kind of explore that a, a little bit further. So can we break it into two parts in terms yep. of social landlords yes. within the city of Glasgow? Mm -hmm. Are you content that none of the combustible material or cladding models such as in Grenfell exist? Yes, from the information that we obtained from the social landlords themselves, because as I said, the difficulty in actually is to, um, getting the information in the first place was actually to firstly establish which properties fell into this category that were domestic buildings, flatted buildings above a certain height, because local authorities don't carry records of buildings simply related to height. And we have many, many buildings in the city that are over 18 metres in height. A lot of them are commercial premises, offices, etc. Um, so we had to start from there. And that's why initially when we went to the social landlords, our colleagues in our housing investment team uh, have very good relationships with social landlords. We said, OK, you know your buildings better than us. Could you look at what you have done to your buildings, building warrant records, etc.? And from that feedback, that information, that was relayed back to the ministers uh, very quickly. Well, be what, a month or two back now. Um, I was actually in leave at the time when the initial request came in, so I know that was fed back quite quickly. So that took care of that part. They fed the information back on their properties as as the building's owners about what alterations or improvements they'd done to their building by 
for instance, recladding the building, whether that's by a, you know, insulation with render over it or whether it was some other form of cladding, but on the, they reported back and we passed that information on to the ministers. Okay, so that, that's the social housing case. Yes. Now, yes. Obviously, there's there's hospitals, there's commercial office blocks, there's yes. a variety of others. Can, can, can you take me through a little bit more of that? And I will bring the other witnesses in in a second. It's just I, I sense mm -hmm. from your initial answer, Mr Barlow, that some of the information given back to the Scottish Government would appear to highlight that there's perhaps more of this form of cladding on commercial property oh, than no, we no. initially thought. No, no, sorry, if, uh, possibly I've maybe misled you part answer. Not on commercial. We never reported back in commercial properties because we weren't asked to do so. Okay. We only reported back on domestic buildings above so, 18 metres. So did I detect a slight nervousness in just giving us that assurance of where, where, where do you feel this type of cladding or cladding system may exist within Glasgow? The, the properties which we have reported back on in the last couple of weeks are private flats, not social landlords. OK. OK, so that, this is why I was, I was... Apologies if it wasn't clear. We, the initial reporting that went back was on the social landlord side of things, and that confirmed from their information that there weren't the, the clad, this type of cladding mm -hmm. didn't exist on any of the, the social landlord side of things. Um, our troll and our research from then on was very much on private flatter developments, and that information we only managed to complete in the last couple of weeks, and I've passed that information over <coughs> to uh, the build, well to the ministers via the Building Standards so, Division. So combustible cladding has been found in some private properties. Yes. Then. Um, it's just not public information yet. Uh, right, so it's, it's now public information absolutely. that exists because you're telling us. Oh, no, absolutely, because um, I'm simply <laughs> responding to the question, but I, I would prefer not to go into the details of the properties okay, if you understand. OK, so let, we won't push you on the details. Can we push yeah. you on the scale of the issue then, rather um, than the detail? I'm wary of that as well, simply because we haven't released any figures to anyone about that, and I've really been waiting. Uh, because we are getting the request from the Ministerial Working Group, uh -huh. We are providing the information to them, and we have obviously we are, as a council, responding to press inquiries uh, and matters like that too. And what we are simply saying is, we are supplying the information to the Scottish ministers, and then we wish to see what okay. they wish to do with the information yeah. before we then take it further. Okay, let's pretend I'm a journalist. Tell me, is it is it thirty properties? More, less in Glasgow um, that have got this type of. At, at the moment, I would prefer not to say. I genuinely would not, simply because um, we have not answer that question to others at the moment because we're trying to be respectful of the fact that the Scottish ministers are asking us for yeah. the information and we wish to see what they wish to then do with that information. Again, apologies to other witnesses, but I think mm. I do have to explore this a little bit further. Sure. Mm. Has the Scottish Fire Service been in to see each individual property as a matter of priority? Uh, no, because at the moment, we was, because the process we've been asked to go through is to notify the ministers about that, and that's ha what we've done. Have you notified the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service? No. No, because again, because we're simply waiting to see what the Scottish ministers wish to do with that, because I know that the Ministerial Working Group and that the measures, uh, that the meetings they will have will include the Scottish Fire Service within that. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I do want to move on to some of other witnesses to, to, to comment, and at some point I, I, will, I will just leave this, but the relationship with Glasgow City Council isn't just with the Scottish Government. There's direct lines of responsibility Glasgow City has in, has in relation to building standards in a variety of areas irrespective of whether there's a ministerial working group mm. or not. Mm -hmm. So given that you, you've established this, um, do you think it would be sensible to to, to go to Scottish Fire Service to, to ask them to, for example, do intrusive fire safety assessments of these uh, properties? I think that's the ma that that's what I'm referring to. That the fi uh, the fire service are involved in the ministerial working group. They go to the meetings as part of that, and therefore the fire service at the highest national level in Scotland will be party to that information at at source as given from us uh, to the minister, so they can then decide at that point working in conjunction with the ministerial working group for whatever matters that they wish to then take forward. And we will we will happily work with the ministerial working group once they have decided what they wish to do with that information. OK, now my only reason for not pushing this any further is there'll be families that stay absolutely. in these properties. And it might be that these properties are absolutely safe. Mm -hmm. um, because if I, I forget the, the other building standards, but it's not just non-combustible, but there's, there's another technical standard, which means the system when put together becomes non-combustible. Yeah, um, BR135. Yes. BR135. So are these properties BR135 compliant? The, the, the properties predate. All the properties which we've notified currently predate okay. the current regulations. Right. 
only because of the sensitivity of people who will live yes. in these properties just now. I'm not going to pursue that further for the moment, but I think we may we, we may we, we may wish to come back to it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's lots more questions I would like to ask. I'm just very very, very conscious of 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 a t taking a measured approach, but I have to allow other uh, other MSPs in to ask ask further questions on this. Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, convenient. Yeah, I would just like to ask uh, Mr. Barlow if there wasn't a ministerial working group on this at the moment, and you found out this information, what would you do then? We would be speaking to the property factors um, to notify them um, of of the matter. Um, legislatively, there is probably not much that local authorities can do other than notify. Um, and that's why we are being obviously cognizant of, um, as you say, the risks of whether it's families or anything else. We wish to make sure that this information is controlled as well as possible and so that persons understand the context of the information that they're given. So it would be through the factors. The Ministerial Working Group had asked for assistance from the factoring agents in Scotland to assist us in the information that we were trying to research. And we, we got some assistance from factoring groups, uh, but at the same time, their information was limited. But as buildings owners, um, we would be putting that information back through someone like the factors if we were made aware of it. But that's why we respectfully say that we, we wish to then see what the Ministerial Working Group wish to do with this, because they are, they are the persons that are asking us the questions. And therefore, as, an, at a, as a national issue, I feel it's best that they actually decide what should we then do? Because they are in contact with people like the factoring agents and everyone else. And I suppose our concern, well, I'll speak for myself, but maybe other colleagues would be, what well, you know, if some tragedy in the meantime occurs while this uh, this sort of red tape admin line has been followed, then you know that that's a concern, obviously. I don't see it as red tape. Uh, I'm, I'm simply being respectful of the circumstance of what it means. As I say, the properties do predate the current standards. Okay, um, we have to inter inter interrogate this a little bit further, uh, Mr. Simpson. Where, where's this information come from? Um, it was from research through our records, our building warrant records. Desktop exercise. Yes, and, and as necessary, trying to speak to um, developers of the time or their agents, architects, some of whom are no longer in existence. So you've not actually been out to see any of these private flats? Some, some of the facts have been looked at externally. Looking at them from outside wouldn't really tell you much information. You can you could look at them in street view and get the same information. It doesn't tell you the nature. If, if it was a cladding product, looking at it from outside wouldn't really give you much information. And when you say predated um, current regulations, what kind of age of buildings are we looking at? They were built under consents granted prior, uh, uh, which... Sorry. They were built under consents that were applied for prior to the, th uh, the 1st of May 2005. 2005. So some of them could be fa fairly modern then. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Some, um, of them were, some of them were completed after 2005 in a consent that was applied for pre-2005. Right. Because so you might be aware a building warrant is a okay. life of three years. So have, having discovered uh, that some private flats in, in Glasgow um, have have cladding that's uh, combustible. Um, have you have you informed the owners of those flats? No, as I say, I, I've, I've provided information back to the ministerial working group, as requested, because of it is a national issue. It would have been no different from any other council uh, that was asked and had but discovered that information. Sorry, do, oh, don't, okay. don't you think that Glasgow Council has a responsibility to the citizens of Glasgow rather than a ministerial working group if you've discovered this information? I think nationally we do, and that's why I'm feeding it back through the ministerial working group, through the government, Mr. because Simpson, it is a national issue. I really apologise for, for ending the line of question. question. We'll ask the question, then I'm going to make a suggestion direct to Mr Barlow, which then allows to move on to the rest of the yeah. witnesses to answer some questions. Yeah. Uh, what Mr. I want Simpson, to know yeah. is if anyone... If anyone has discovered this elsewhere in Scotland, well, we in private have, flats, well, we certainly haven't done I don't know, but I mean, the ministerial working group will obviously collated all that information. So, we have Mr. McCauley. I'm going to take it. Mr. Thane's been very patient as well. But Mr. Barlow, first of all, rather than saying we're we're content with ending this line of questioning here, I don't think we are content. We'd like to pursue this further. So I think we'll be seeking information from the Scottish Government as soon as possible. I think we'd ask uh, Glasgow City Council for as much of a detailed briefing 
as soon as possible, as soon as humanly possible, mm -hmm. actually, in relation to this matter. And we maybe request Glasgow City Council to come back to this community, this committee, in short order to to answer further questions in relation to this matter. If that would be agreeable to Mr. Barlow as well, I I will speak to our chief executive on the matter, and I I, I could see why yes I, I couldn't mm -hmm. can come back, but obviously I will. Bearing in mind the sensitivity of the information, I'm fully cognisant of why you're asking these types of questions. I would not disagree with. Mm -hmm. Uh, any of the, the opinions expressed about the concerns that it raises, I wouldn't detract from that. Um, but therefore, I, I would simply say that yes, I have provided information to the, uh, to the Scottish Government at the moment, and that's why we wish to allow them to advise us what they want to do with information, because it's a national issue. It is a national issue, but there's a direct local responsibility, irrespective uh, of whether this national working group absolutely. Exists, exists or not. And people listening to this mm -hmm. or reading about this tomorrow in the newspapers mm -hmm. will want to know, is it my flat that's affected? Mm -hmm. Is my flat dangerous? What is the risk to my family? And they want those questions addressed speedily and effectively with a view to reassuring them as quickly as humanly possible. And the only reason I'm ending the line of questioning here is we don't want to create an alarm that's not required because reassurances might be able to be given speedily, but we simply don't know that yet. And I am also conscious there's 32 local authorities in Scotland and it's not just Glasgow. So I'm actually looking to my fellow committee members at this point, I'm going to move on with further lines of questioning, but I think we do have to return to this. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Mr Thane, you've been waiting very patiently to come in. Um, <coughs> I so was referring back to the earlier point um, that was being discussed about social housing. Um, my role here is as a chief housing officer, with the um, representing the association of local authority chief housing officers. And I just maybe thought it would be helpful to give a wee bit of context about essentially the response of local authorities, and certainly because we're close relationship with. Um, housing associations of what different sort of organisational landlord point of view. And I think that even on the morning of the fire, um, when myself, colleagues switched on the news, we knew what sort of effect it may have on our tenants and residents. And I think there was a very reasonably, certainly quick response to have housing officers deployed in those tower blocks um, to reassure tenants and to hear their concerns because of the huge media coverage there was. And the second response was, and or again organisationally, was to review the landlord records, so the local authority housing records. And I know, in speaking to my colleagues who are directors, chief executives of housing associations, exactly the same process was being done almost prior to any request for information from the Scottish Government to check what we knew as details emerged over the hours following the start of the fire of what materials were used. And I would think that within probably the week, certainly the feedback given to Scottish Government colleagues um, by local authority housing services and by housing associations was very much through the checking of the records, which are probably as the developer and the builder of those houses and the maintainer of those houses more complete and then you would have through a sort of regulatory system in terms of building warrants. And I think that showed fairly comprehensively in that conclusion that no social housing blocks or blocks owned by housing um, councils or housing associations had the same materials that were used in Grenfell Tower. And that was done fairly quickly from a very much a management and if anything a customer reassurance response and taking the, the responsibility as landlords that we have to ensure in that our tenants are safe and that they also feel safe as well. So that, that I think the, it was to give a bit of context on that and the response of social housing landlords to this um, in, in the immediate days, hours and days after the after the tragedy. And I'm conscious that I'd cut, I'd cut Mr McCauley off. Uh, do you want to come in at this point, Mr McCauley? Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Um, it was just a, a general point to your initial question around how local authority to verifiers establish whether the CCM panel has been in place. And very much it's a case of we work with our, our local housing and technical departments, those that are responsible for the maintenance, the upkeep and the overseeing of the buildings. Uh, we do that through uh, research through our historical archives, as Mr Thane alluded to there, and Mr Barlow touched on that as well. So we make 
uh, archive records related to building warrants, completion certificates, the material specifications that are available um, to, in our own council, housing and technical resources, who were initially responsible for responding back to the ministerial demands. And I, th I think that, that is the general approach throughout the country. Um, just to clarify the original point, that we are involved, local authority verifiers are involved in assisting the collation of that information. However, the responsibility for the maintenance and the upkeep of those buildings are out with the, the, the verifier role and we provide information to allow those responsible within each council to submit the information required by Scottish ministers. Okay, thanks. M Mr Wood, I'm just wondering, just to mop up some of this line, line of questioning, um, you're confident that all 32 local authorities in the social housing sector anyway, they, they're content that this combustible cladding or cladding type wasn't used. Uh, are, are have the other 31 local authorities been interrogating the, the private sector and how many of them have said that the, this cladding doesn't exist? Um, so I was I was just going to kind of speak to that that national yeah. picture that's been built up um, by the Ministerial Working Group and okay. through officials as well within the Scottish Government. Um, so immediately after the fire, <clears throat> I think the next sort of 10 days to two weeks, there was a number of um, requests that went to local authorities, I think directed to chief executives and to um, chief housing officers as well, seeking information on the type of construction um, and uh, the number of high-rise properties above 18 metres uh, within their area, the type of cladding that had been used. And I think there was also um, a separate questionnaire that went out about um, cladding that had been installed uh, using heaps abs funding that the Scottish Government um, issues and the collation of that information was done by the Scottish Government um, but our understanding from what they've fed back to COSLA and what's been put on the Ministry of Working Group's webpage is that it came back with confirmation that there was uh, no cladding of the sort suspected to have been at fault at Greenfield Tower within any of the houses that were uh, that were surveyed. Um, so that, <clears throat> in terms of that building up that national picture, it seemed like quite a lot of bureaucracy, I suppose, when, within that short period of time. But I think that it's been useful in, in allowing ministers and COSLA and locally elected members to be able to give the reassurance that, that might be required of them. OK, final question. I want other committee members to come in to explore line, line, uh, uh, lines of evidence. I mean, it's our understanding that the Scottish Government will create a national database of every high-rise property right across the country on that database, whether it's social rented or whether it's private or whatever, including the types of cladding. Uh, I'm assuming, given what we've just heard from Mr Barlow, that this would be a pretty positive step and a fairly essential step to better under, un, understand the state of Scotland's housing stock, be it social rented or otherwise in Scotland today. Would you all support that? And the obligations and local authorities to help keep that fresh and updated and accurate. Mr. Wood, your light went on first, Mr. Wood. That's why I'm, I'm asking you. Yeah, I think that I think that would be certainly useful. I mean, I um, I can't speak necessarily to the challenges that um, there would be in getting the relevant information about private rented properties, but I think that the. <coughs> Um, the information is there within council records with regard to social housing at the moment, um, and so it shouldn't it wouldn't be an onerous task to do that. And I think that it would it would serve a purpose. Okay. Any other information should be on that national database? Because I'm, I'm I'm conscious that you know in a few years' time something else could happen in relation to building standards, and we'll have to scurry about and check building warrants and historical archives and work out, um, you know what material was or wasn't used in a building and what the construction type was. And that's a laborious, long drawn out process. Is, is, is there a compelling case being built up for a much more accurate, detailed national database of high rise properties in Scotland? Uh, Mr. Thane? The only thing I would add to that is <coughs> that absolutely local authorities have a role in supporting the maintenance and providing information for that database. I think, just referring back to the earlier discussion, there is a, I think it's worth reflecting on the responsibilities of owners of private properties, of owners and property managers and factors of private properties to know their buildings and to share that responsibility or to have quite specific responsibilities for making that information public um, on, on such a database. And I think, I don't know if the solution or the mechanism to that, I do think that it's worth reflecting 
given the earlier discussion about the challenges that there are, so, some of these buildings will go back <clears throat> into the 90s or the 80s or whatever that, um, that, that we have, particularly in urban areas for buildings of that size, many of which are in private ownership or managed by private property agents. I just think it's worth reflecting on the, what responsibilities owners or their agents have to update such a database um, as well. Would it be a, is it currently an offence for owners not to provide relevant information as requested by local authorities? Because you can contact the private sector as much as you like. Get, getting a good quality detail response back may be another matter. Do they have to respond to you? I think in the, in the context of this debate about the safety of these buildings, um, I think that the, there is a requirement, whether it's a however a database is set up or whether through a national agency or administered through local authorities or whatever, the requirement for owners to provide information or for property agents to provide information should be looked at as well. Um, at this stage, in this context, in setting up a database of such properties for the purpose of making them safe, I would doubt we would have necessarily direct... There are two things here. One is that who owns those buildings? Um, and the um, and and then who requires which statutory bodies then administer that database, whether it's a central agency, a Scottish government agency, or local authorities themselves. So I just think somewhere in this discussion is the requirement for those owners and the property managers of those buildings to have a requirement to provide information by whoever is administering that database. I, I, I don't think I want to add anything to that. I think you've summed up what my thoughts would be. Before I move on to other MSPs to interrogate other lines of questioning, anything else any witness wants to add on this section of questioning? Oh, OK, Elaine Smith. Thanks, um, convener. And actually, something did spring to my mind when the convener was asking that, which is there was reports last week about fake fire-resistant glass being sold across the UK and Ireland, which is something else. That, that might need to be addressed, I suppose. But I did want to turn specifically to the challenges that, that um, were mentioned in response. And in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the written submissions, COSLA and LABS have said that building standards should remain a local authority function. So I want to explore that slightly more, <coughs> excuse me, and just ask, um, do you think, do you have any comment to make on the suggestion that local authority building standards departments might be under-resourced, and if so, how could that be tackled? And tying in with that, do you have a view at all on the ring fencing of the, the building standards fees income, which would then exclusively be used for the provision of building standards services? I suppose um, the question might be, first of all, to COSLA, who have specifically said that building standards um, should remain within local authorities. Mr Woods? Yeah. That's correct, yes. So the COSLA's response contained that line, um, and it's our view that the, there's a benefit to be sought from um, 32 building standards authorities, um, that there would be no geographical overlap between those, and that there's a line of accountability directly to the local communities that those uh, councils uh, serve. So that, that that's our line, and I... Um, I'm no expert in this, but I have heard reports about building standards changes um, south of the border, which have led to a bit of confusion. Um, and uh, I think that we would we would stick to that line. In terms of the ring fencing of um, building standards fees, I think that COSLA had, had responded separately to the previous call for evidence before the summer. Um, in our view, as a sort of point of principle, is always that ring fencing of funding is not something that we support. Um, we think that uh, when funds are gathered, the local authority should have discretion to, to use them as it sees fit. Um, and finally, on your point about the, the sort of resourcing of um, building standards departments, um, if I'm very honest, I, I wouldn't have a, a view on that. Um, but I think that it's certainly the case that we always need to be mindful of the sort of capacity. Um, that exists within councils and other public bodies to apply regulations. I think that uh, rightly a lot of the focus um, after Grenfell within Scotland um, and by the Ministerial Working Group has been on the regulatory framework that exists. Um, and whilst I can't speak to 
exactly what it looks like on the ground at the moment. I think that there's there's no point in having a regulatory framework if there aren't people there to, to enforce it. Um, so that, that would be my answer to that. Okay, Mr. McCauley. Yeah, just on the local standards point of view, we have made the, the, the case uh, for the reappointment of local authorities as sole verifiers uh, back in 2011 and more recently based on, we feel, very, very strong case of our independence, the fact that local authority verifiers are experienced, skilled, qualified and provide services local to the needs of that, their own geographical area. Um, and we, as local authority building standards, still stand by that. It's fair to say, though, um, that the, the local authority building standard services haven't been immune to the cuts faced by local authorities across the country. Um, but that's not to say that that has affected the quality of the verification service delivered by local authorities. It simply means that we need to prioritise better, use our resources where the, the risks are the highest um, and that is something that, that is ongoing within local authorities and each local authority is, is different. Um, with, with regards to the, the issue of ring fencing, the fees, um, I think anybody in a local authority environment is always hopeful of that. And what we have welcomed in the back of the least recent fees increase is more explicit expectation from the Scottish Government that those fees should be directly invested in the del delivery of local authority services, in bringing on trainees and younger people into the industry, into the service. And that's very much our aim and our drive within our own authorities, although that is still a challenge within each authority. But it's also fair to say that the, some authorities are moving out of um, the, the challenges of previous years. Each authority is, is at different stages, but there is significant recruitment in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in authorities around the Central Belt and other, way, other, other situations in the country. So there is, you, you are seeing um, more people coming in, new people coming in, which is very much uh, turning the corner, as, as it were, from the challenges that we had before with, with local authority cuts. So, so we're moving in a positive direction. And from local authority building standards, Scotland's point of view, one of our key aims is to ensure that anybody coming into the verification service is provided with the skills and support to allow them to be an effective verifier, to allow them to have a, um, a, good, a good career, if you like, um, and to support the delivery of verification within a local authority environment. Okay, thanks. Anyone else want to come in on that? I'll leave you to follow up on some of that. Um, Graeme Simpson. Okay. Um, yeah, Mr. McCauley, uh, we do know each other because I used to be a councillor in South Lanarkshire. Um, but you, you, you made the comment that you thought everyone was, everyone was providing a, a, a good service, but that's not quite the case, is it? Because some, some councils have um, only been given uh, permission to verify for another year. I think Edinburgh was one of them. So they're all performing at different levels. I think we can accept that. Um, my, my question is... Um, uh, back to this desktop exercise uh, of uh, fire safety, um, is that is that being what all, all councils have done, or has anyone gone further than that and actually gone out and tested stuff on the ground? The the housing department they, they've led on this, um, so I, I really can't speak on behalf of the, the housing department. We've assisted where, where we can uh, through the desktop exercise and, and looking at archive records. In addition to checking and verifying records, certainly my own local authority and I know other local authority housing departments are doing some processes. There's, in my own case, we have something like 50 tower blocks. So there's maintenance going on all the time, and we took the opportunity of those blocks where we had maintenance going on, going on at that time to go and to check that what was on our records was what was on the buildings. We also commissioned some work, which is underway just now, to, um, to do that check across all the blocks just to give us the further peace of mind that we have already. But the checks that we have done verify what <coughs> is on, on our records. Um, the, again, my colleague mentioned, the, uh, Alan mentioned the balancing risks with priorities. And so unless you took off every panel of every block 
and checked insulation whether you will never have one would have never have one hundred percent certainty. But the quality of the records, the processes by which projects are managed, particularly in the so sort of local authority housing association sector with clerks of works and project managers and a lot of checking and verifying um, the quality records and then the, the opportunities that landlords have taken to check the material that is on and as I said in my own authority we checked the where we were undertaking maintenance and I verified that on those blocks our records were absolutely um, um, accurate. So there is some of that follow-up, invasive checking has been going on as well. Mr. Wood, did you want to add anything? I'll take Mr. Barlow in after that. Mr. Wood first. Yeah, it wasn't tied very much to that, other than that that's what we've heard as well. So from speaking to COSLA members, mostly it has been sort of desktop, desktop focused um, research. There has sometimes been a demand for intrusive inspections to be undertaken. I think that those um, sort of granting those requests has been few and far between. Um, uh, and partly that's because when you sort of open that door, when do you stop? Uh, but also there's, in, sort of in keeping with the, the need for local authorities in particular and social landlords to um, to continue to reassure the communities that, that live in the tower blocks, I think that in the immediate aftermath to see sort of scaffolding going up and a, and a drill going into a wall when it's not necessary um, has, has been something that we've tried to avoid. Okay, Mr. Barlow, did you want to add anything? Uh, really, just to add in support. I think they've summarised it fairly well. It's been predominantly desktop exercise from a Glasgow point of view. Um, we, I suppose any of us would have difficulty for speaking on behalf of all the authorities because we have such a varying amount of high rise properties. Probably Glasgow has the most, maybe Edinburgh close behind. Um, but I think most of it has been desktop exercises. Okay, um, Mr. McCall, did you want to come in? Sorry, no, thank you. No, no, Mr. Simpson, you're pursuing a line of question. I'm just noting that Jenny Gould has got a supplementary. But Graham, do you want to continue with this for the moment? Right. Okay. Jenny, just as a, a supplementary. Sorry, good morning to the panel. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Mr. Wood, just to go back to your point, you say you think most of your members carried out desktop exercises in terms of how they surveyed um, what was going on. Um, you don't have a central point of contact then at COSLA who has that evidence. You didn't survey your members as a matter of course then as an organisation. Yeah, so we, we considered that actually, um, but we work, we work so closely with the relevant department of the Scottish Government that they were asking the right questions, they did it very quickly, and we didn't see that it would be useful to add another identical survey to that, so we, we sort of let them get on with the work, they have the contacts, I think that in, I think that in some cases we would have provided contacts where, they were, um, where the Scottish Government didn't hold them. Um, and the Scottish Government has, and we've really appreciated this, have kept a really open line of communication with us in terms of what the responses to those surveys have been. So I'm just trying to establish then, you didn't act as a central point of contact for your members to feed into, and then you fed that into the, the Ministerial Working Group, for example. You allowed your members to do that themselves? Um, yeah, yeah. Not, we didn't do that on this occasion. Okay. We sometimes provide that function, um, but given the, the swiftness of the Scottish Government response, it just wasn't necessary for okay. us to do that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr Simpson, did you want to follow up any on that? Yeah, yeah just um, really for uh, COSLA, whether anyone who wants to jump in, Cos COSLA's evidence said um, building standards, systems and regulations for high-rise domestic properties in Scotland mean the type of product used on Grenfell Tower should not be used in their cladding systems. However, such cladding has been found in new build properties such as uh, a large development of student housing uh, in Edinburgh. Um, so your evidence is not entirely correct. You know, if we've if we have found it in certain types of properties, so I'm just wondering, you know, how f how far this desktop exercise uh, extends um, across Scotland. Uh, obviously, we've looked at student housing, but have we looked at commercial premises, um, hotels, for for example, um, which are over, over 18 metres? How far has it gone? Uh, Mr Barlow? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to answer from, again, Glasgow perspective, but the request that we've all responded to was on purely domestic buildings uh, for, say, the verifier side of things for flats. Now, I know there were separate requests that went to the local authorities, say, on their education premises, uh, and I think a separate request went to the health boards. But what, for instance, we didn't get was a request for, say, hotels, as an example. We weren't asked to look at those matters. Um, just to pick up on the student housing point of view, um, quite often something is described as student housing, 
but for the purposes of the building regulations, it might not be classed as a house, it might not be a dwelling. Uh, if you imagine it, <coughs> excuse me, the traditional halls of residence, the classifications in the building regulations uh, are dependent on how the architect wishes to approach the design. So some may be designed purely as a, a mainstream dwelling that they opt to rent out to students, but other ones aren't designed like that, even though they're commonly called student housing. There. Ah, they're, they're clearly dwellings. No, for the purposes of the building regulations, they may not be. No. Cool. That, that's, there is a, for the purposes of the building regulations, if, a, if, if a, a property is designated as a dwelling, if someone wishes to design it as a dwelling, then it must meet various criteria from thermal performance to fire uh, mm -hmm. precautions, etc. But you can have a person sleeping in a hotel and you will know, obviously, clearly you know it's a hotel, that it's not a dwelling. Student residences, uh, over the, certainly about the past 10 years, have come in in various formats. And the designers, when they put to us in the building warrant consents, have used a variation of approaches, some of which have followed a mainstream dwelling design, others which have been a sort of hybrid, is the best way I could put it, that may reflect the layout of, say, a hotel, something that is more akin to you would simply have a whole load of bedrooms one after the other, maybe no different from a hotel, but people commonly call it student residences, but it's not a dwelling for the purposes of the building regulations, and so therefore different regulations apply. So, diff oh, gosh. Um, so different regulations can apply. We'll let you pursue this further, but Mr yeah. Macaulay wanted to add something, and then sure. I'll, I'll let you back in immediately. Yeah, hopefully, if that's going to be it seeks to clarify. The, the, uh, in that context, there is additional significant fire safety features that are required in a hall of residence or a hotel, etc., uh, which mitigate the risks of, of that particular building use, uh, whether it be extensive alarm and detection, depending on the height of the building suppression systems, but limited travel distance, compartmentation. So there's other features in there that work along with um, the a suppression system if it is required to, to make sure those buildings are safe for those that, that, that are occupying them. Um, so, so whether it's, it's, it's a dwelling or, or whether it's, it's used effectively as a dwelling, there are additional regulations that, 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 in, in the building regulations that seek to make sure that those buildings are, are safe. So that's the reason that I think they are considered non-domestic, because the regulations then allow you to ask for these additional fire safety features, which you wouldn't necessarily perhaps uh, need in, to the same extent in, in a true dwelling as, as we know it. Could I add one Thing to on, one, I, sorry, one of the things about that would be if it was a, a student residence in the type that's not a domestic building, not a domestic flat, it's a managed building and it doesn't have the same place, the defending place scenario that you have with domestic high rise. You have actually a managed building there with the different types of precautions that Alan was highlighting. They, mm -hmm. they are different, it's a different type of uh, precaution that you put in there, but essentially a managed building, so not the, not typically the single stair, high rise, domestic, defending place that you may have with something like Grenfell. Uh, Mr Simpson? Yeah. Any less confused now? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit clearer, but but a bit, a bit concerning, I think, um, because you've clearly got people living there um, most of the time um, I would regard these uh, as, as as dwellings uh, and I would expect that halls of residences are built to the highest standards and have cladding uh, that is non non combustible that's what I would expect and certainly if my uh, son or daughter was in in these places that's what I would want so if we've got different regulations applying that that is a concern. I think we as a committee would want more information on that. Um, the fact we've found um, accommodation, student accommodation in, in Edinburgh that doesn't meet the standards that we would expect is a worry. Um, so I'll just leave it there. It's not really a question, it's a point. Okay, thanks. And just before we move on uh, to the next question, I know we're indicating this session we finish at 11 o'clock. I think we'll go to at least 11.20 anyway because members have to get the chance to come in and ask questions, so I'm just giving a note on that. Can we just take cladding out of the equation for a second? I know it seems almost impossible to do that, but in relation to, say, managed student accommodation, such as has been outlined there, are some of the fire safety standards higher in those buildings, putting the cladding to one side completely for a moment, compared to, say, dwellings? I don't, I don't want to get caught up in the semantics of it, I just want to know about the fire safety standards. 
is, is there a higher fire safety risk for l large, large student accommodation where you have 100 students in halls but it's not a dwelling, it's a managed accommodation, therefore it might be able to have that cladding as we're now finding out in Edinburgh, but are there other fire safety standards that are higher than those required for domestic dwellings? I just want a bit of clarity around that. Mr Barlow. Yeah, the, the, it, what, what the question you've asked there highlights the fundamental difference in the building regulations throughout the UK, not just in Scotland, that domestic high-rise buildings and, and other ones where you may have sleeping accommodation in it address fire safety from a different approach, where one has a defend in place, which is the domestic side, and other ones are managed buildings where you have different features, different precautions. So, for instance, one of the things you would have <clears throat> would be a full building alarm system you know, a full early warning system that links into every bedroom, every common area, which you wouldn't have in, the, in domestic buildings. And therefore, you have, on top of that, you have the building management. Uh, you have other, other aspects about the escape widths, travel distances and matters which we deal with on a daily basis on a technical level. But the precautions still tr uh, try to achieve the same end and they achieve a safe building. But they are, it's a different way of approaching the same thing. Okay, so the committee has to wrestle with whether that form of cladding is ever acceptable in any building above a certain height, irrespective of whether it's a dwelling or not, and that's something we're obviously looking at. I just wanted a bit of clarity on that. Um, Mr Whiteman, thank you for your patience. We'll move to yourself now. A um, couple of questions on two sort of separate topics. I mean, first of all, we've had evidence in general on the um, shortage of skills in building standards. Um, Elaine Smith was talking about lack of resources, um, uh, RICS have told us about a chronic skill shortage, very few higher education institutions offering a building control option. Um, could you just say something about what you consider to be the state of play with the building control industry and profession, particularly in light of the fact that we've heard concerns about the need for greater ins greater degree of, of, of inspection of new build property, and yet the resources and the skills appear to be both lacking and perhaps declining? Okay. Mr. Aiken, is that okay if I take this? Yeah, I think uh, it's important. I've mentioned this to the committee previously uh, another, during another session that we, we look at building standards holistically. You know, I think that's vital that we do that. I don't think we should just look at building standards services in, in isolation. Uh, when you talk about RICS um, uh, uh, statistics there, that's, that's, that's industry-wide, construction industry-wide. There's a shortage of skills. So we, we shouldn't lose sight of that. If we don't have the skilled tradespersons uh, on, on the ground, if we don't have the numbers going through the, the colleges, you know, the, the, the pipeline uh, is affected. We need uh, the, the project manager skilled up. Everyone needs to be uh, have, have an input to achieve compliance with building standards and have an awareness of building standards. Now, Labs has worked um, uh, closely with... The, the construction sector. Just recently, we had an event in, in Dundee where we had 150 delegates from across industry, um, and we, we tried to scope out what were the, uh, uh, the perceived gaps in, in the compliance agenda. Uh, and we're producing a, a, a paper to come from that um, um, uh, event, uh, and, were, and we're more than happy to share that with the committee because I think that was what was mentioned previously that you want to be more proactive, if you like, uh, in terms of building regulations. Um, Labs is engaging with uh, Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, we've had several meetings now uh, looking at what, what, what can be done uh, in terms of um, encouraging uh, greater numbers to go through the, the, the colleges and, and the universities to, to fill these gaps. Um, work, uh, workforce planning is a, is a big issue, but that goes right across all public sector. Um, you know, there, there's an ageing profession and, and we need to be sure that we're on top of that and we have proactive approaches in place to, to address any shortfalls. Um, I think in general, building standard services are, are you know, I, I speak uh, generally here, uh, are, are, are well placed. Uh, I don't think the, the shortages that, 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 that you're explaining are, are, are at a critical stage. I'm not, I'm not saying that there, there, there aren't gaps, but I don't think it's at a, a, a critical stage. Um, and, you know, I think the labs as a body uh, are looking um, and, and taking the lead from government in terms of where we can share, uh, share services, share uh, skills um, uh, across the board. You know, so that's the type of thing that labs as an organisation are, are currently working on because we, we, you know, we know it's there and we're trying to deal with it. OK, thanks. That's very helpful. Um, um, I think Mr Wood might have wanted to come in and add something there. It, it was just to... Um, 
just to endorse that, I suppose, and, and I, what, rather than focusing purely on building standards, I think that, as um, my colleague indicated, there's a, across the public sector, there is a concern that uh, a reducing workforce means that um, trainees coming into various professions has an impact on um, the capacity of those services and the skills that lie within them. Um, and I think that specifically with regard to fire safety, um, the, the kind of anecdotal evidence is that there is less um, resource available for general staff training, and that might be um, for housing officers, it might be for building standards professionals. But I think that um, at, at, at some stage, the public sector has to um, recognise that and um, be able to invest in a workforce and a skilled up workforce that can um, that can last into the future. Uh, Mr. Barlow, and then I'll let you back in, Mr. Whiteman. After that, just one last point. Um, I, on behalf of Labs, as several months ago, attended a meeting organised uh, by the Scottish Government. Uh, it was chaired by Homes for Scotland, and it brought together uh, representatives across the industry uh, from planning, building standards. Uh, some of the universities were there. Uh, there was representatives from um, various industry bodies, and it was about trainees and bringing people through across. Uh, the industry, because the recognition was there is that if we were to, for instance, deliver the social housing targets that, the, that we all have over the next number of years, is there capacity in industry to do that? Uh, and they were therefore trying to look at all areas, not just local authorities for bringing people through. Uh, we as a local authority have brought some through ourselves. We've brought in some graduates over the last few years. We're a bit more fortunate than others. But I think the recognition is there across the industry that, that uh, uh, we need to staff up all the way through and bring through the next generation. Mr. Whiteman, do you want to pursue some of that? Uh, thanks. No, I'll leave that there. I'm conscious of time. The other question I wanted to ask was, um, you know, a number of witnesses have stressed to, to us, of course, that building standards and building warrants are for, for new build, and once they've complied with that, then it's over to the owner to, to maintain uh, the building. The properties that Mr. Barlow uh, was highlighting to us early in this session, of course, apparently meet building standards because they didn't. They were built prior to the upgrading of the fire standards in 2005. So I'm just wondering whether there's any merit, and to look at too detail here, but having a better system of recording the um, upgrades and uh, refurbishments that have taken place to older buildings. I remember I was in Edinburgh City Council recently and I was taken into a little room that showed me banks and banks and banks of, um, of uh, index cards. Uh, they showed inspections that Edinburgh City Council did of all the tenements in Edinburgh, for example, up to about the mid-80s. And they were looking at everything from common stand, you know, the roofs and the closes, picking up any problems that might arise in relation to access. Uh, presumably fire safety was part of that as well. But there isn't any kind of regime like that, and there's no, com there's no obligation on building owners to have any kind of log books that record maintenance. And given that a lot of our buildings are very, very old, it means that consumers who buy them haven't a clue what's in these buildings or when they were last, when the roof was last inspected, for example. I'm just taking a broad indication of the, do you think, if there's any merit in exploring that for the Thank future. Thank you, Mr. McCulloch, because yes. everyone was trying to avoid eye contact with myself <laughs> to answer that question, Mr. Thank McCauley. You, um, just in response to Mr. Mr. Whiteman's point, I think I would, from the building standards perspective, from the verification role, the, the records that we keep uh, and we are required to keep through legislation with regards building work, which, you know, only go back a number of years, I mean, robustly, maybe back to the late 60s, et cetera, um, are very, very detailed. And obviously, going forward with electronic recording, et cetera, they will continue to be very, very detailed. So with, with regards to construction work that's been done in the relative past, uh, the relatively recent past, there is robust records there, and they are we are custodians of that and they are available for inspection to, to anybody. Where we draw the line is at the, the point of completion, and it may be for others on the panel to, to, to provide advice about the level of information that is provided and available after the verification role ends. Now, that's not to say that if, if there is refurbishment work, obviously, that may be warrantable, then we have the building warrant process to record the information, the, the, the level of work that was done, the materials that were used, the inspection processes that, that were um, undertaken, the certification that was given to us to allow completion certificates to be issued. So that will all be there and, and recorded and held uh, by the verifier. But as I say, I'm, I can't answer for anything more routine in terms of fire risk assessment or ongoing maintenance schedules that would be applicable to these buildings and perhaps there, there, there are others that may be able to fill in that gap. Mr Thien? Um, I think the, the example that you refer to in 
terms of Edinburgh Council and the index cards from 1982. I think we just need to reflect to carry out that level of say, public sector led inspection would be a very expensive task and quite resource intensive. It also probably raises the question of what do you then do with that information, if you think broadly about the condition of buildings. Um, I go back to my earlier point about need, I think we need to reflect on the responsibilities of individual property owners. So if you look at the social housing stock, stock owned by local authorities and housing associations, is subject to a regulatory regime which requires certain standards to be met in terms of housing quality standard, the environmental standards and things as part of its maintenance, upkeep and investment in existing stock. In private sector owned buildings, and there's a further complication with properties in common ownership, um, that the responsibilities for owners um, are less onerous, I think. And I think if we were looking more broadly at how we inspect, how we look after the condition and the safety of buildings that are already built, then there is probably some reflection on what the responsibility of individual owners are to that. And I think you referred to, for example, there's no requirement to keep logbooks. Um, so are there measures that can be put in place which raise the awareness of the condition of property among building owners and also some level of requirement on them to meet minimum standards as they uh, move forward in terms of looking after those buildings. And I think it's worth exploring those options as, as well, recognising the, I think, some of the discussions we've, we've just had about the um, challenges in res resourcing local authorities in terms of the skills, but also the financial cost of taking on that responsibility for knowledge and, and ownership. The 1980s would have been a different fiscal period for local government than when we are now, for example. Anyone else want to add to that? Mr. Wright. Thanks very much. I, I, that was very useful. I mean, just to confirm, my, my, my question was targeted at uh, seeing as to whether there's any merit in exploring the obligations that are actually placed on owners, you know, to maintain records, obviously, within some kind of perhaps light touch regulatory regime. But I, I'll, I'll leave that. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Convener. Um, Mr. Reid, if I could go back to you, I'm not picking on you, honestly. Um, I'd like to, to consider the role of COSLA in terms of what you did in the wake of Grenfell. So in, in your written submission, you speak about um, housing office managers, uh, officer managers rather, going out to reassure tenants and an additional 900 fire safety visits by a Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, so last week, in evidence from the Scottish Federation uh, of Housing Associations, um, their evidence said that housing associations made tenants aware that fire safety, uh, fire service rather, uh, they offered free vis advisory home visits. So these visits were not compulsory. Do you know if your uh, members did likewise? Um, yes, they will have. So I, I couldn't speak for absolutely every one of them, but I, I do know that in every local authority area, there's been close work between the housing department and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services, LSO, their local senior officer, um, who's the kind of single point of contact in that area. And that um, in, in most places at a community planning level, there has been that communication in housing uh, departments within councils have made their tenants aware of that service that, that can be provided by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I think that it's yeah, you probably safe to say that that isn't going to cover absolutely everybody in every single apartment um, and something that has come from conversations at a national level and also has been endorsed by the Ministerial Working Group is that the, there would be a national fire safety campaign led by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service mm -hmm. and supported by councils that would provide that sort of very basic but important information to tenants of high-rise apartments um, about how they should behave in the case of a fire and also advising them of the um, the service that's available from the mm -hmm. Fire and Rescue Service. Okay. Um, in the response we heard last week from David Stewart, he said that those visits focused on vulnerable people. Do you know, again, if your members targeted certain groups of individuals who might be more vulnerable than others? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, using the existing relationships that there are between 
housing officers, um, health and social care workers where possible. Mm -hmm. um, we are making sure that we engage with the most vulnerable and the, and the people who might not be able to find that information themselves. And similarly, just to go back to that um, campaign that will be run by the Fire and Rescue Service, um, we, I was at a meeting earlier this week among officers to discuss the sort of campaign brief for that, and there's a very clear focus in that on inequalities and making sure yeah. that um, any messaging delivered by public services is targeted to the most vulnerable people who don't have English as a first language, mm -hmm. elderly people, disabled people, etc. Um, in evidence we heard last week, again, some housing associations require a safety visit as a condition of their tenancy. Are you aware of any local authorities doing likewise? Um, I, I'm not aware of that, no, but I, okay. I would imagine that that would be the case. I think that, um, I think that a housing manager would probably be able to answer that better than yeah, I, but I would, I I would guess that. that that's the case. Okay, just one wee final question, I promise. Um, in the, the final page of your evidence, you say that there are issues uh, in terms of a common problem being residents removing self a self closer from fire doors or leaving fire doors open. We heard similar evidence again from uh, SFHA last week. How widespread is that problem? Do you know? Have you surveyed your members in terms of how you know that's going on nationally? We don't have um, any quantitative evidence of, of that, but it, it comes up a lot, and I think we can't deny that it comes up a lot, and it's speaks to the fact that at the end of the day um, you can have whatever system you want in place that's tried and tested but human behaviour will always um, will, will, will quite often get in the way of that um, so mm -hmm. people holding doors open um, people replacing doors without permission um, objects being left in closes and that sort of thing these are these are the tasks that um, concierges or housing managers often have to deal with um, and human behaviour, human error is something that always has to be accounted for. So no um, no quantitative evidence on that. We could get it to you if, if you desired, I suppose. But um, but it's certainly something that I think that we're, we're all aware of enough that it, that we know that it needs to be addressed. OK, thank you. I know Mr Thane wanted to add something to that. Just briefly, maybe to add to the point about the relationship between local authorities, landlords and the, um, and the fire service. In, in addition to promoting individual visits to individual tenants, the, the, the regime, again, most lo in, in most tower blocks would be, certainly my own authority, and there is a daily inspection by concierge services or housing officers of tower blocks to identify immediate risks. So issues like door closers, broken um, rubbish, in, on a landing or furniture, blocked bin shoots, whatever, is checked on a daily basis. On a quarterly basis, um, the fire service will come in, do an inspection of the block and a familiarisation visit for their teams just to check fire risers, to ensure that their um, fire crews are familiar with the blocks. And following Grenfell and the work that we've done with the fire service, because we immediately did a joint inspection of all our tower blocks, that um, I think over the four to six weeks after Grenfell, we've agreed to do a, a joint inspection as one of the fire services quarterly inspections, so our property teams, house and managers, and the fire service out once a year to do a thorough inspection of the joint areas. Um, so that that's in addition to, and we've, we've also working closely with individual um, tenants, vulnerable tenants, to ensure that we're prioritising visits to um, to those most vulnerable and in need of that advice. But also the, the information and advice is provided to all tenants. So for some tenants, they can make those arrangements them, themselves. They can improve the fire safety themselves like any other resident. Um, the, and, but we try and make sure that the most vulnerable and those who would have most difficulty with that would be, are, are supported to do it. The, <coughs> Maybe just also just as final as a wee bit of context, the, shortly after Grenfell, we did a review with the fire service of how often there are fires in our tower blocks. And so my own authority area, that's about 40 blocks, and there's a f on average a fire each month. And so if you go back to the period we've had those blocks, so that's probably four or 500 fires in those tower blocks, which is broadly the same incidence of fires in the non-tower block stock 
And the fire safety measures, the construction, and again, I'm talking about local authority housing, has certainly my own authority area meant that that fire risk and the fire measures and things have been put in place have contained and protected against the spread of that fire. So there's a wee bit of just context there that some of those arrangements that are in place on the management side are um, recognise the risk of fire and there's pretty good strong relationships in most areas I think between the fire service in terms of prioritising those blocks, recognising the, the, the risks, working with the, the owners in terms of local authorities and working with the tenants as well. Okay, um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, uh, One question for Mr Wood and then a more general question on materials. Mr Wood, COSA notes that there is no national standard fire risk assessment uh, and it's been suggested that a group of that nature should be developed uh, and progressed, especially uh, for domestic high-rise buildings. Uh, how, uh, how is that going to be progressed? I mean, you, you've, you've noticed there's a, a, a gap in, the bar, in, that, in that process, uh, but how can that be progressed? Um, yeah, so that, that's something that we had um, that had previously been raised, I think, by the Fire and Rescue Service and by the FBU as well. Um, in, in terms of how that could be progressed, I, I, I guess the Ministerial Working Group might be um, a catalyst for that. Um, but I think that if, um, if there was an agreement across agencies that such a, um, a standard assessment uh, was required, then agencies could come come together at a national level and, and discuss how we would take that forward. And, and, and you fundamentally believe that that would be a real benefit if that took place? Um, I think that it, it would certainly help. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I think it would certainly help. It's something that um, had been identified over the, over the summer as something yeah. that would, uh, that agencies would welcome. Um, I think that the clearly wouldn't be a, a one-size-fits-all approach to every separate property, but I think that if there were uh, general principles upon which um, fire safety assessments were undertaken and that there was consistency in how they were dealt with, um, then it would help professionals to be able to uh, to undertake them properly and, and for the next steps following the mm -hmm. fire safety assessment, which is, I suppose, the most important aspect exactly. um, for people to be clear on that. And. Other members of the panel, do they have any views on that? Ms McCauley? Yeah, it, it kind of touches on a wee bit uh, to, to some of our evidence, which related to the, the, the consistency of understanding of the design principles from construction and the warrant assessment process to how that building is managed in practice. Um, and we are you know, routinely um, asked about the design philosophy of a building, where the key areas are, um, but that kind of that, that relationship does tend to drift as the buildings become, uh, you know, established and people move in, people move out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, I think there is there is improvements to be made in a national standard for fire risk assessment. I think that would be a, a benefit. I think also uh, knowledge of the design process and where the fire safety features in the building are and why they're, why they're there would be an essential part of that. Um, even simplistically, you know, highlighting where the protected walls are, where the protected floors are, where the fire safety features, um, where, where they're contained, how often they should be maintained, etc. Some of that will be in there anyway. But to join up the verification process and the, the fire risk assessment process in general terms, I think would be, would be of advantage to the ongoing fire level of safety in, in a building as it's, as it's used. Thank you. And, and my second question was, we, we've touched on materials, and especially ones that are combustible with reference to the, the tragedy, but when we have had some concerns from this committee in, in recent time, where materials have been tested, uh, which were thought to be non-combustible in the past, and then when there's been retesting, they've had limited, uh, or, or the, the, it's changed uh, the, di the dimension uh, because they did uh, ignite uh, after a certain situation or circumstance. Now, how widespread is that issue, do we believe? Uh, and if there is that, how can we allay any fears uh, within the community about that? Because as I say, that has certainly been an area that we thought we had ticked the box, uh, and that has not been the case because now, uh, after retesting uh, by the fire service and others, uh, there has been uh, further evidence to suggest uh, that it has limited, uh, uh, and that's a problem. Mr. Barlow. 
I suppose to simple answer your question, we don't know how widespread it is um, we, until you actually identify buildings that supposedly had a compliant material and then find it isn't. We, we don't know. Um, I suspect the difficulty, from what I understand at the moment, the difficulty may arise from um, materials which were supposedly uh, met the, the criteria of BR135 through what you call a desktop exercise. And so where you had, therefore, a, a fire safety expert saying, well, I have a test of this product here built up in a certain way. It passed the, uh, the tests from the BSs as part of uh, BR135. And then examining this product over here, I think it's very similar. I've seen many tests before. That process, I think, has, has built up over the years. There's aspects of BR135 appear to allow that in terms of its wording, and it's certainly grown up that way. Um, and I think that's possibly where you'll find the failures. I'm not currently aware personally of any product which was actually tested to 135 in, in the BSs and it has now failed. Um, it, that may well come out, but I'm not aware of any. I mean, the, 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 there have been tests that the fire service have done, and when they take a mm. block, they normally mm. tape it round and, and, and put the uh, in the centre. Mm. And that, that would appear what the test normally does. But mm. when they've actually tested the, the perimeter... Uh, it, it has found in some locations that that, that then became combustible. Uh, so and it, it's it's the type of testing that's taken place in the past, yeah. and then when they uh, and the, and the products is managed. Yeah, we were myself and uh, Dave were at a conference last week uh, in Birmingham, organised by our counterparts in England and Wales, and we had various industry professionals there, some of whom are involved in the testing yeah. side of things, and talking about the, the robustness of uh, the, the, the British standard tests as part of BR135. Those professionals think that as a, as a test, it is just as about as robust a test you can get. The difficulty with any testing regime, and, and this goes to all manner of tests across uh, building standards and, and various British standards, is that you're testing a product in a, in a, in a, in a, a laboratory-type situation, in a factory situation, uh, you're using a standardised fuel load and whatever, and does it cover all of the exact detailing of, as to maybe how that will be built on site? Um, so whilst the test clearly can, it can be, it's a very robust test, it's a, quite a large fire you put under uh, um, uh, in the crib uh, for this side of things, compares well with international tests, if not more robust than international tests. Will it be 100% guarantee? I don't know. Thank you, convener. Okay, thanks. Just mop a couple of things and we'll go to Mr Gibson in a second. Mr Stewart was asking about... Uh, we'll go to, we'll go to, Mr Gibson doesn't want to ask, well, we'll go to Elaine Smith in a second and just give Elaine a, a wee warning on that. Uh, so Mr Stewart was exploring the idea about uh, fire risk assessments and safety assessments and the, court, the, the, the standard of four a year in high-rise properties. Now, I have to say, before I then ask this question, I've got a very good relationship with my social landlords in North Glasgow, and they seem to be incredibly proactive, so I'm not saying they would do any of this, but if I knew the fire service were coming a week on Tuesday, that, that mattress that's been on the at the fire escape on floor five for the last three weeks, I'd be getting my concierge to get that sorted. That fire door that doesn't quite fit properly, I'd be getting that sorted as quickly as possible ahead of that fire service visit. So the expectation and the planning and the coordination of when the fire service will be there gives all of us, if we know we're about to be assessed, to step up to the mark to make it as smooth and compliant as possible. Now, the FBU, who wanted intrusive inspections, didn't call for on-the-spot random assessments, they were happy with pre-notification, but is there not a case, maybe just occasionally, for the fire service to pitch up, be it private sector or social landlord, be it council or housing association, say, the Scottish Fire Service, shows your paperwork, we're doing the assessment now. Would that not be a reasonable way to keep everyone on their toes? Any thoughts on that? Mr Thane? Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that that's how we've done it the, in my own authority area where the fire service turn up. They do their familiarisation visit, they do their inspection, they let us know what they think needs to be fixed and we, we, we pick up on that. So th there isn't, if anything, actually <coughs> after um, Grenfell, the discussion has been more about coordinating those visits. But I absolutely take your point that the um, fire service snap inspection and things is also a way to keep yourself on your toes 24 hours a day. I'm happy to make it an ill informed question. If that's already what happens, I, I apologise. Is that, is that everyone's understanding that's what happens? 
think from the verification point of view, we are a stage removed from that part, right. part of the process. I mean, if I can maybe align it to the inspections that are undertaken by building standards, you know, there is a degree of notification around that, maybe not to the exact day, etc. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's, there's similarities from what you're saying to the building standards inspection. When they know we're arriving, then, you know, mm -hmm. there's a degree of preparedness. But you have to then make sure that those undertaking the work, those undertaking the management mm. of the properties, you know, for the life of that building, are, are appropriately skilled, trained to undertake their core duties, never mind who's going to be watching them at any particular time. That's right, and I'm not saying if every inspection should be random and you just turn up. I mean, there, uh, the example I gave to the FBU was in the, the, the care inspectorate have planned inspections of care establishments, not talking about fire safety, I'm talking about social care, but every care establishment knows there's just that outside chance at some point there might just be an unannounced inspection and it really does focus the mind. Uh, that said, I mean, in, in my area, I'm very fortunate in the relationship that our housing associations have with the fire service. Uh, so I won't explore that in, any further. Aileen Smith. Thanks very much, convener. Um, throughout our inquiry, we've heard some evidence that Clark of Works are not, um, not, not something that are employed as much as they used to be on building sites. So I wonder if you have a view on the role of Clark Works ensuring compliance with building standards in both the public and the private sector developments. And related to that, do you think that public um, so public sector procurement could play a role in ensuring that um, new building refurbished council and RSL housing meets the building standards requirements? Mr Deacon? If I said uh, previously, you know, the holistic approach is, has to be welcomed and um, all stakeholders involved in the construction process have an input and Clarker works obviously as, as, as one of them. Um, there's no silver bullet to this uh, solution uh, in any perceived compliance gap. But yeah, for sure, you know, a, a, a Clarker works would have a role to play as would, as would others. But I suppose if I could just push you further on that, do you think that if there's no Clark of works, then rather than the clerk of works having a role to play, can that cause problems, particularly if there's a lot of maybe small subcontractors and once that building's being procured or in a big housing mm -hmm. development, can, can no clerk of works cause problems? Well, I think as the, the convener pointed out, you know, the, even the threat of uh, having a clerk of works on site would be enough to keep workmen on their, on their toes, you know, so the absence of one, you know, would, yeah, clearly, I think um, there's chances of maybe shortcuts being taken. Ms. McCauley, do you want to add? Yeah, just re related to that is that the, the role of a clerk of works on site is welcomed by the verifier in general because in, it does tend to, to lead to a better regime of inspection and checks on site. But I would say that the role of clerk of works is very much for the, the, those procuring the building. It supports their duty uh, as the relevant person to ensure compliance with the building regulations. So it's there to help them discharge their responsibility, but in turn, it does assist us when we undertake reasonable inquiry, because if we know there is uh, three or four clerk of works expect inspecting various parts of the building in conjunction with our visits, then there is a higher chance of compliance. Um, so, so we, as a verifier, very much welcome clerk of works. On the opposite side of things, if we undertake an initial inspection once notified that commencement of, of work will, will happen, and we have concerns about even such things as the setup of the site, the attention to health and safety legislation, alarm bells start ringing, the absence of clerk of works, the absence of a site, uh, site foreman, uh, perhaps concern around the quality of work of the subcontractors, then our risk assessment through reasonable inquiry is, is upped and we pay more attention to that particular uh, that particular project. And the opposite side of things, when we have uh, confidence that a, a development is progressing well, then we can step back to a stint and that allows us to use our resources in the most appropriate way. Can I just push you, uh, um, convener, if, if I might, a bit further on then the sort of public procurement that I mentioned initially and you also mentioned there. So, for example, if a council is... Um, is going to procure a company to build schools or a health board's procuring for the building of a hospital, would it be possible as part of that procurement process to insist on um, a clerk of works presence? And do they? Um, I, I can't really comment on that, Ms Smith. Um, it's, it's something that, that from the verification point of view, and we're in our role and responsibility in that, it's, it would be for others to um, see whether the role of a clerk of works would, would allow them to get value for money during the procurement process. But from a verification point of view, um, 
I wouldn't really have a, a comment, to, a further comment to make to what I'd, I'd said previously. Mr Barlow first, Close, first what so. comment. Um, I, I don't know whether they can insist through, on it through the procurement process. I'm, I'm, I'm no contractual expert at the end of the day, but I, I could relate some experience that uh, Glasgow City Council did that on uh, a lot of their school projects. We put our own council clerk of works on there, even though they were being built by uh, the schools being built by other bodies, and and <coughs> excuse me, sorry, and it certainly uh, proved very effective for us because when the council went back to look at aspects of the the school's construction um, in relation to you know the Edinburgh schools issues etc, um, we did not find the same issues. There were it was acknowledged some areas where no building is perfect, but we certainly did not find. Uh, the areas of concern that were found in Edinburgh schools. And as a council, we were confident that was because of the regime that we had put in place for our, our own council clerk of works. Okay. I had one final question that wasn't on that. But I, I know Mr uh, Whiteman might have had a supplementary right. clerk of works. Sure. Uh, just, just, I'll come back to you in a second, Mr Whiteman. Can I just double check in relation to okay, procurement? You're, you, you don't know the answer to that. But as local authority building standards issuing warrants during the verification process, could you, could the local authority insist that they will only give a relevant building warrant and compliance to the verification process unless, irrespective of whether it's public or private sector or whether there's procurement involved or not, unless there is a clerk of works given the risk of the site? Would that be a desirable power to have? Anything that, that, that seeks to assist us in our role in achieving compliance um, should be explored. Um, I, mean, I, mean, I know it's a little bit just kind of plucked out there, but you know, if someone is is building an extension to their to their property, and and you know the architect and so on and so forth, you might think there's lower risk. We'll go out and do one site visit, or I don't know. But you know, if someone's building a 250 unit development. Um, and they don't have a clerk of works on site. They may have a, an insurance indemnifier on site doing various other things, but that's not necessarily a clerk of works. Um, would it be reasonable to have the power to say, we, 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 we expect for risk management there should be a clerk of works? Sorry, Mr Barlow. Sorry. Um, what I would highlight on that, firstly, is that there is a, there's a good bit of guidance out there currently from the Scottish Government trying to uh, say to uh, developers, etc., what their responsibilities are before they sign the completion certificate for the project and making it clear that they have to have appropriate contractual arrangements in place to ensure that when they sign that certificate that says the building complies with the building warrant and the building regulations, that they have done so on the basis of that someone has given them enough information to do that. The, wh what we have found, I think, is labs, and I would speak on behalf of labs here, if you don't mind, is that you know that that aspect has never been able to get firmed up in legislation. It, it tells people about their responsibilities, but there is no legislative way to actually enforce that from ourselves um, and to say that if the relevant person, as they're known, signs that certificate, we have no mechanism for questioning what the what processes they carried out before they signed that certificate to allow us to then get, get, allow, uh, give occupation of the building. Okay, that, that's helpful. I, I know that uh, Mr White made a supplementary, and we'll come back to Elaine Smith again for the final question of the session. Oh, you do it's not, not a supplementary, but another question. Oh, well, I'll take you to Elaine Smith, and we'll let you finish off, Mr Whiteman. Thanks very much, because actually it, it's, it ties in with what Mr Barlow's just said. So in terms of um, building standards enforcement powers, we did hear calls for new powers, but it would be interesting to just ask you if you would support that and what powers you would like to see introduced. It's, it's a very difficult question to ask to what you see introduced. Um, I, I genuinely don't know, but I do personally think that we have to see something which says um, what is the system that the developer has gone through uh, and the checks and balances that they have put in place to, to so that they know the contractor they've employed has employed the right subcontractors, the right qualified persons. I can go as a joiner on site just now and be a joiner without any qualifications. It starts at that level in the industry, unfortunately. That's always been the case in the UK. Uh, it's, not, it's not an unknown matter for us all. And that's not to say contractors out there don't have to try and have quality systems in place, but are there those that don't? So it, it's, it's, it's a very large issue it's a very large issue, but it, for us, it's a matter of if there was legislation, it would be a case of what points in that legislation would you say that they have to give us uh, information 
whether it's certification that I've got qualified staff, whether it's a case of um, the steel erectors put up the correct size and weight in, in, in of steel down to the fire stopping and the fire the fire matters. Do you get certification for each stage of the process for the particular building that then goes together as a collective and is then given to us to at least demonstrate that they have signed something off for each relevant part of the process without it being self-certification at the end of the day, but simply an assurance that they have got contractual measures in place that are relating back to compliance with the building regulations, not just a contractual matter for them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whiteman. Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, just a brief point. Um, it's been raised in evidence to us that um, private owners, particularly in mixed tenure blocks, have been removing and replacing what were fire doors with doors that don't comply with fire regulations. Um, can you confirm, first of all, they're perfectly within their legal rights to do that? Uh, and secondly, do you think that's potentially a concern given the number of mixed tenure blocks? Mr. Wood, you, you, you seem to make eye contact there, Mr. Wood. Yeah. Do you want to answer okay. that question? Um, I, think that, uh, I think that that is the case. Um, and certainly um, there is a, there's an issue with regard to fire safety and more widely about enforcement um, of standards um, among owner occupiers within mixed tenure uh, properties. And we're seeing that come to the fore in conversations, for example, about energy efficiency at the moment, which is, which, so there are a number of areas in which um, the, the lack of means of enforcement for privately owned apartments within a, within a multi-tenure block um, can, can be an obstacle um, to, whether, to enforcing standards, whether it be um, fire safety or um, with regard to energy efficiency. Mr. McCauley, did you want to add? Just in response to Mr. Michael's question, um, specifically, you know, you you can do a number of alterations to a high-rise building um, without building warrant. Generally, those are repairs, and generally they require to be like for like. So, if you were to replace a, a fire door with a, a non-rated fire door, then that isn't a like for like situation. So, there is an issue there, um, and I'm not. I would, I would suggest that, that it's not an uncommon occurrence, and not through any maliciousness intent. intent it's just somebody trying to maybe upgrade their, their own property, may look, make it look better, without knowing the intended consequences of that. Um, within my own authority, and I'm sure it's approach that, that, that's, that's shared nationally, is that we, when made aware of that situation, we d tend to work with the owners, the occupiers, those responsible for the upkeep of the building, um, to make them aware of the performance that that fire door should comply with, um, and we, we in, in our own account, council, uh, we provide financial support uh, to do the work, the replacement work, in, in, in the form of a grant. We provide the labour to do that as well. So it's very much working with the owner to to remove the door that may or may not be compliant, and to ensure that the door that, that's replaced is um, a compliant fire door that meets all the the relevant regulations. Um, so. It's something that we, we, we tend to, to use our kind of um, our knowledge and our education, uh, as opposed to using um, strict enforcement powers. Um, and we've had a, a, a good success rate with that, and the numbers in South Lancashire are very very low because of that engagement. We also work closely with Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, um, and we also know and, and again this this grays the, the, the area a little is that UPVC fire doors um, are available on the market now. So you, it's, it's not as easy as going up to a door and saying, oh yeah, that, that's easily identifiable as a compliant door or a non-compliant door, and then get into the, the area of giving us um, manufacturer's information, test data results, which you know we, we're, we have the knowledge to establish that and we work with that owner occupier to make sure that that door is, is, de is, is to the level of fire safety that, that it should be. But just to be clear, is the owner under a, a legal obligation once the building has been completed and it's met all the legal requirements? Are they under a continuing obligation to maintain a fire door where a fire door was specified? Yes. You say, you say it's an issue. Yes. Um, you're, you're allowed... That this is where you know, it touches on maybe some of the challenges around the enforcement powers that are there. Um, you're allowed to make repairs and alter aspects of the building like for like without a building warrant, fire door being, being one. So if um, just to be clear, that if those are permissive powers, if someone uses those permissive powers out with 
the circumstances in which they're allowed to be used. That would be a breach. Um, yes, because it's not an exempt alteration. Now, the legislation is, is challenging for us because uh, the unauthorised alteration uh, legislation is a Section 27 notice, um, but that requires us to, to ask for the submission of a building warrant, which you don't need in this situation. So it's a catch-22 situation in that, in that respect. So it allows us, or it means that we have to just use our knowledge, skills, communication, engagement with that person to ensure that that door is then replaced. But it, but it, it can be tricky because, um, you know, while there is dangerous building legislation, which is one of our most powerful aspects of the Building Scotland Act, it doesn't, because a door is, is, is maybe not uh, the, 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 the appropriate level of fire resistance, it doesn't necessarily make that building an immediate danger such that the immediate yeah. dangerous building legislation has come in. Thank you. Okay, I think that's a very helpful line of questioning at the end, uh, Mr. White. So thank you for that. Just about to close this this evidence session. Just just before I do, um, Mr. Barlow, thank you for the information you gave us at the start of the meeting. You'll appreciate the committee was a bit concerned to hear uh, in relation to private properties in Glasgow that would appear to have combustible cladding or Grenfell type cladding on it, and obviously you didn't feel that you were able to give additional information at this point. I, I think the, the committee would appreciate uh, Glasgow City Council giving this committee the maximum amount of additional information that you'd be able to, uh, because we'd want to obviously robustly scrutinise the situation in Glasgow, but also as a committee, help provide uh, reassurances mm -hmm. to those that are living in those particular high flats. We'd be keen to do that in a measured way. So the maximum amount of information that you could possibly give on behalf of Glasgow City Council would be welcome. That said, very informative session. Can, can I thank everyone for uh, taking the time to come along to the committee today? And we'll now move to agenda item two. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so agenda item two, we'll, we'll, we'll move <coughs> on uh, quickly. Uh, the committee will consider negative instrument 273 is listed on the agenda. This instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provision will come into force unless the Parliament votes on a motion to annul the instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on the 12th of September 2017 and determined that it did not need to draw the attention of the Parliament on any grounds within its remit. I can inform the committee that no motion to annul has been laid and can invite members to make any comments on the instrument they may, they may wish to make at this stage. Okay, so we've got uh, a number of members wishing to comment. Mr Gibson. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Um, I think this is very positive. I know it's a negative instrument, but it's a very positive negative instrument. I think it's a, a step forward. Just um, one, one issue, though, um, in section two of the, or paragraph two of the policy objectives, it says that, um, uh, that this would reduce the time to a maximum of seven days unless there are exceptional circumstances. I'm just wondering what the exceptional circumstances might be. I don't really see any kind of examples of that, and I do think that sometimes the word exceptional circumstances can be used in reality to effectively nullify uh, an instrument such as this, because um, unless there are parameters on that, then I do have concerns that, you know, that a uh, coaching horse can be driven through it. Mm. OK, thank you for putting that on the record, Elaine Smith. Yeah, actually, I share those um, concerns as well, because my worry would be that the exceptional circumstances might be nowhere else to move the, the family to. Um, I also think we should just uh, mention the fact, obviously, that, that our committee is looking into the whole issue of homelessness. And this would be something that we might also want to consider as part of that. And the minister mentioned this uh, moving from 14 days down to seven yesterday in his statement to Parliament. But I think we just need to make the point that no one should actually be in unsuitable accommodation for any length of time, whether it be 14 days or seven days, if a family are in unsuitable accommodation, which is not wind or water tight, um, is not suitable for occupation by children, or there's maybe no cooking facilities. These are some of the issues that are mentioned in the policy note. Then actually, seven days is seven days too many as well. OK, any other members wishing to comment at this stage? OK, so we've got a decision to make uh, as a committee. We can obviously write to the Scottish Government raising these these, these particular points. Um, the, the, the question we have to ask is uh, whether we can agree that we do not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument, with the exception of the caveats of writing to the Minister 
in relation to, to the themes outlined. Yes. Uh, on, on that basis, can we um, check with our clerks that's the competent way to deal with this? Is that reasonable? Okay, are we agreed in that yes. approach? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And we now move to agenda item three, consideration of evidence, which is a private session. So, suspend.
Well, welcome back to this meeting of uh, the committee. And can I say, I'm Elaine Smith, and I'm chairing this session. The committee has been looking into the causes and possible solutions to homelessness since February 2017. And today we will hear from some people who have got direct experience of homelessness. So can I welcome everyone here today? And you can see we're in a round table format for this session. So what I'm going to propose to do at the start is to go around the table and just quickly introduce ourselves and I'm going to start on my left for this purpose. Hi there, um, I'm Jason Nairn and I'm one of the clerks of the committee. Hi, I'm Jane Williams and I'm also one of the clerks of the committee and on my left I have my two colleagues from the official report who write down what's being said. I'm Kenneth Gibson, a member of the committee. Uh, my name's Saffron Rohan, I'm a care experience member of the Life Changes Trust's advisory group. Alexander Stewart, MSP. I'm Thomas Lyon, service user for Shelter, Scotland. Andy Whitman, MSP. I'm Julie McCulloch, and I'm a volunteer for Shelter, Scotland. Uh, Jenny Gilruth, MSP. Uh, Emma Pearce, uh, volunteer for Shelter, Scotland. Graham Simpson, MSP. Uh, Rhys Campbell, homeless person. Uh, Simone Smith, I am a care experience young person who is part of the Life Changes Trust Advisory Group. Thank you very much. And as I said earlier, I'm Elaine Smith, MSP for Central Scotland and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Uh, the Committee are really pleased that you've come to join us in this roundtable format so that we can share information and the committee members may have some questions as well as we go along. But can I actually start with asking each of you if you wouldn't mind sharing um, your story and a bit about your background just to open up our proceedings and I'm looking for a volunteer that might want to, to start. That's great. So Emma, Emma Pierce, thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually care experience myself as well, um, but I'm actually talking about my homeless experience. Uh, I currently stay in the Salvation Army. Um, I have, this is the second time I've been there um, and I'm here today to share a bit about what I feel could be changed and what could be a bit better and how it could be improved. Okay. That's great. Emma, maybe if we just come this way and we'll, we'll go around. Rhys Campbell, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself, please? Uh, I've been in the homeless sort of section for two years now. Uh, probably been through around nearly every hostel in Dundee. Uh, spent a lot of time in a, like a, a flat, like a next step flat, if you will. I can't remember what you would call it. It's like a flat just before you would get a flat, if you know what I mean. Uh, was in there for nearly a year. Something happened there. And, I've sort of been put back to another hostel where I've got to just ride out where I'm sort of near the top of the list with the council, apparently. So I'm just waiting on word at this precise point. Great, thanks very much. And Simone Smith, please. Uh, so, as I said before, I was care experience. So after I left foster care, I became homeless numerous times and went into different like, hostels and temporary accommodation. It wasn't really a safe environment for me and my daughter. So that's why I'm here today, because I believe that we we can make a difference for homelessness. Thanks very much, Simone. Um, Saffron Rohan. Hi, yeah. Um, so I, through my care experience, I moved into my first tenancy when I was 17 and it was a supported accommodation unit. Um, we felt that it would be better than going through the homeless route and trying to get a council flat kind of on my own. It wasn't very supported. Um, there was quite a lot of negative influences. It was quite a bad environment to be in at that age. Um, I think you're quite uh, easily influenced as well. And I'm just here to talk a little bit about my experience and the experience of other care experienced young people and how we can sort of help prevent homelessness within this group. Thanks very much. Uh, Thomas Lyon, please. Oh, yeah. uh, I spent six and a half years in the street in Glasgow. I'd done every hostel three, four, five times each. Uh, I never got offered any temporary accommodation. I had to go to the legal service agency to get put in a temporary furnished flat. Uh, I ended up getting involved in a lot of violence in that flat. And I went into an institution and then I was told that I had to return to that flat. And I went to the MSP Bill Kidd. He sent a letter to the head of self and social care, David Williams. And that's the kind of, to get me moved into a proper accommodation because I was getting sent back to a violent place. But 
and I'm here to just hopefully give my experience with Shelter helped me with that. Great, thanks. Thanks, thanks very much. And Julie McCallagh? Right, uh, I brought my four daughters up through homelessness and through me being homeless, uh, my daughters had to go to 11 different primary schools in 11 different areas that affected their education. And I just think that something else should be done, especially when there's kids involved. Right, thank you all um, very much for sharing that with us. And again, as I say, for joining us today, can I look to my committee colleagues to see if anyone wants to kick off here? Uh, Graham. Yeah, um, so thanks, thanks everyone for coming. And you've, you've obviously all had different experiences and you want some, all want something um, individually out of this session. So I wonder if just going around the table, um, what you think we should, we should be doing as a committee? What, what asks would you have maybe of the government? What, what do you think should change? Uh, and what would help you in your individual circumstances? Because you'll all say something different. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. I should have said Graham Simpson. I should have used your full name. Um, I wonder if we could maybe start that one with uh, Saffron, because I think you mentioned that supported accommodation wasn't supported. So maybe that's something you could tell us a bit more about um, on the back of Graham's question. Um, yeah, so I, I, I got moved into a two-bedroom flat because it was the only flat that they had available at the time. Um, I didn't really have any qualifications. I'd left school at 15. Um, I didn't have a job, so I was obviously on full benefits at that time. But that also meant that going back into further education wasn't an option because I would lose those benefits. So that was kind of a, one of the effects. Um, and one of the biggest things for me at that point, I think, was the change with the bedroom tax meant that I lost my discretionary housing benefit. By this point, I'd got a job as a modern apprenticeship. It was very low wages, so maybe like six or seven hundred pounds a month. Um, and that was to manage a tenancy as well. Um, but the criteria for discretionary housing benefit changed, so I lost that. So my rent like doubled and then I also get, got started getting charged £70 a week for the extra bedroom, for which there was no appeal process. And on top of that, because I just turned 18, I started having to pay council tax as well. So I'm still paying off the debts five years later that I got into in a supported temporary accommodation unit. Um, so that's one of the biggest things for me. But I think there are quite a lot of challenges for care experienced young people in particular because they do come from more deprived backgrounds. Um, they also tend to leave care around the age of 17 as well, um, which as many of you will know is not old enough to know really what you're supposed to be doing. So I think there is a massive lack in terms of options. I ended up stuck in an area where I did not feel safe. I never went out of the house. Um, because there was no other supported accommodation units and like I'd stayed in a sort of nicer area when I was younger and had some friends and stuff there but there was absolutely no council flat options in that area because it was very desirable and I was 17. Um, I found the housing association quite cold and unhelpful as well. Um, benefits are very difficult to get at that age and they are very quick to remove them for any reason they can. Um, I'm trying to think what to, what to go into next. There's so many things. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more in terms of options for care experienced young people and young people that are presenting as homeless. Obviously, local authorities now have a duty as corporate parents um, to be a parent of these young people that are in care. So why are they presenting as homeless? Um, also, they should get support with things like living costs. Um, my situation only improved because of the new legislation that meant if I went to college that the local authority had an obligation to support me. So they started paying for student halls and I was able to move out of that area eventually, but it took three and a bit years. And like I said, I still have a lot of the debt and things. Um, I have met other young people that are often put into temporary accommodation as well where there's virtually nothing in the flat and they're expected, if they want to watch TV, to purchase an aerial themselves for a, a flat they're going to be in for maybe six weeks. And if you're on £55 a week, that's not an option. So I think even the ones that are lucky enough to get a tenancy, even if it's not in the area they want, they don't have any money to make that a home or any support, so they don't end up with sort of negative 
peer influences or letting people in their house all the time and then they end up losing the tenancy and just go through the same sort of cycle. Does do any of my colleagues want to ask Saffron anything about that before we move on and put Graham's question to um, the other folk? Ken? Yes, uh, Saffron, I th thanks, uh, Convener, and thanks very much uh, for that, Saffron. And I mean, I, I think you, uh, the paper that's been presented is an excellent one. Um, you, you, in your paper, and also just now, you've talked about more housing options um, and support services in all local authorities, areas. I'm just wondering if you can expand a wee bit more and tell us what kind of housing options you feel that should be uh, considered. Um, I think there needs to be supported accommodation that isn't run by housing, for a start, because they certainly don't have any idea of the sort of they have a they had a complete lack of understanding of sort of the challenges and the adversity that kid experienced young people face um they also don't understand the vulnerable nature of this particular group i think there needs to be there's obviously a lot of council housing out there but none of it is allocated specifically for care leavers um i do think due to the more vulnerable nature of this group they should have they should be placed in better, safer areas um, as well, so they don't get sort of dragged into local trouble, which happens all the time. Um, I know one boy just now who won't even leave his house in the area that he's in because he has been placed there. He doesn't have any other options, but he has issues from when he was younger with other local boys that live in that area. So now he's stuck there when, like, and he won't. He literally won't even go to the shop. So. So if I can just follow up, if it if it's not um, a housing that run it and perhaps or possibly even a housing association, would it be some a charity like Who Cares Scotland or something like that, for example? You would be, you you think would be more appropriate as a kind of yeah, I think or like sort of youth intensive support services. Mm -hmm. I know that social work are extremely stretched, but maybe something similar that worked alongside mm -hmm. them, or even just people with experience of working with kid experienced young people. Um, the there's not enough sort of permanent options as well. A lot of it is just temporary accommodation and things like B and B's where you're put with like drug use and at sixteen or seventeen to be with like thirty and forty year old people that have drug and alcohol problems, you're very sort of susceptible to that as well. And it's certainly for young mothers like Simone, it's not a safe environment to have a small child at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks, Kenneth. Thank Can I ask? I know we'll come back to some more questions because I do want to move on to everyone else. But Jenny Goruth had a follow up for Saffron. Yeah, it was just in terms of the the debt you, you talked about. In terms of owing that debt, then Saffron, um, was that to the government or was that debt you accrued yourself or audity for council tax? Right, I did okay. manage to get some of the rent arrears. I paid some of them and the rest got written off eventually but that was after several months of having a through care worker sort of hounding them and debating with them and right. it took a very long time. The council tax there's no appeal process for that so I'm still paying off that debt. Um, I, I didn't pay it at all because I was struggling so much yeah. just for food and stuff like that and travel to get to work. Um, I do think council tax exemption for care leavers would be very beneficial um because mm -hmm. the corporate parenting law states that they should be supported up to the age of 26 and if someone was living with their parents up to the age of 26 they wouldn't have to pay council tax yeah. okay thanks um i'm going to come to simone smith next because uh, saffron mentioned and the question from graham originally was around um what what do you think could change to make a difference like for me being care experience, like the main thing that always pops in my head is that there should be an allocated worker for care experience and people that should be a priority in all local authorities because we like they have faced so many challenges. And when like when I remember when I presented homelessness, they were weren't really supportive. Like they didn't really understand that I don't know areas, I don't know people, like and they just were like, Go here and deal with it. Like so I think we should have somebody allocated to every local authority so they have somebody that can kind of understand what they've been going through and understand there might be challenges and support them like every step of the way in, instead of just quickly writing you off, I would say. OK, thanks very much. Um, Rhys, would you like to tell us what you think could, could change and what might make a difference? I just think it would be very beneficial to people who are in a homeless situation. I mean, the length of time I've been in there, from the time I went into a homeless situation, there was, I mean, the drug use was main reasons whilst I was in there. Uh, it took me a lot of time to get myself back on my feet, so to speak. 
Uh, temporary accommodation was what I was looking for earlier after spending a year in temporary accommodation and getting myself back to normal, shall we say. Uh, I was told I would not be put out of there and put into direct access again until I was found a flat, because I'd been on the housing list for so long. But before they told me this company called Positive Steps were apparently meant to be sorting this out, and this didn't happen. The 28 days had come up, they said it was going to be happening. They then stopped me back into direct access, which was probably the worst of situations for me to be put straight into. Right? I then had to practically beg on my knees to ask the girl to move me from the dorms to along to the flats just to get away from certain things and certain people that were surrounding me to keep myself safe in these situations. So now I'm in a, in a hostel where everything is rife and right on your doorstep, right? Even though I'm feeling better and feeling safe, it's still a, a constant thing I have to deal with for the rest of my life, you know what I mean? So I think it would be, I, I know when you're homeless at the end of the day you need some place to stay, but there, I see people coming in and out of these, some of these hostels that I do not think should be in these certain hostels. And I see them coming in there and I see them leaving there worse than they come in. Hey. How long have you been in the hostel? Sorry, Graham. Graham Simpson. Which one? Graham Simpson. How long have you been in the, the hostel you're in now? The one I'm in now? Yeah. Three weeks. Three weeks. I was only told I'd be in there two days. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Well, did you have um, problems in the first place um, getting accommodation at all? And secondly, if you had been dealt with on a, a house and first basis, is something that Basically, you're looking into? Basically, what happened was I, I had my own... I mean, I used to work abroad, I had my own business, everyone was fine for a while. I mean, I had everything going well, you know, houses, cars, whatever, and lost everything. Lost my family, lost my son, lost a lot. Couldn't keep it together. Uh, from that point there, I fell into depression and then towards drugs. Uh, I had no problem getting private lets at that point because at the time I had money, etc. And then I was put on a council list. I had a council house previous to this. I then left that council house to move to Birmingham for a period of time. I moved to Birmingham, I worked with Jaguar Land Rover, Aston Martin, etc. I spent a year down there, everyone was going great. Moved to Oxford for a year. I come back up to Dundee. Uh, after spending a bit of time in Dundee, it gave me access to my son twice a week, which was good. Uh, certain things happened with the girl I was with at the time, which got that stopped. Um, and then before I knew it, that relationship went a wee bit sour. So I was now back in my own city. I didn't want to be back to my mum and dad's. So I chose to go and say that I was homeless, <coughs> represent as homeless and get myself down on the list. Now, from there, it's just took an awful long time to get anywhere. And basically, after spending that nine months, well, nine months near enough, in Burnside Mill it was, which was a temporary accommodation, which was where I pulled myself together, I was promised to be relocated in a house, whatever, house, flat, whatever, away from hostile environments, as in hostile living, not hostile, hostile, you know what I mean, environments, but basically I just feel that I was fed a lot of nonsense, to put it bluntly, and I'm just back to square one almost, and I feel like I've been told by many sort of well-respected, like Salvation Army, that they were supposed to have done this work, they've not done it, and here I am, stuck in hostels just now with, I mean, with all sorts surrounding me, with all sorts. You know, they're probably the worst hostel in Dundee. Thanks, Trace. Do colleagues have any follow-up questions for Simone or Reese at this point before I move on? Alexander Stewart. Thank you. You've both explained some of the harrowing experiences you've had, and we, we hear a lot about joint working, about partnership, about cooperation between agencies. Do you really feel that that is the case? Well, I've done all sorts of engagement. All sorts of engagement. I engage with everything possible. I've <laughs> expressed every bit of that I'll engage with anything that I needed to get out of the situation. I've went to recovery groups, I've went to all sorts. Mm. This has not been plain sailing, no. you know? And even throughout the time of in these hostels, these temporary accommodations, they are aware a recovery process isn't plain sailing, no. you know? So, 
and, and I'd done as best I could. I'm queen, I'm giving queen samples, mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, I, yeah, I'm doing everything as I should, engaging with everyone as I should. No, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not in this situation because my life's perfect, no. right? You know, but it's getting there, back mm -hmm. to where it used to be. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, I mean, if I'm in certain hostels and that, I mean, it's to be aware that certain issues are going to arise at certain times, when times in my life, if I'm having difficulty with families, etc., mm -hmm. I've used all sorts of tools, etc., that I've been given in, like, recovery groups to get me through situations. But sometimes it's not that easy mm -hmm. when you're in a hostel where it's on your doorstep, mm -hmm. it's five-minute throwaway, you know, usually from what I'm taught, it's like you get a 20 minute urge. If you could beat 20 minute urge, you've got 80% chance of beating that. It's not much luck when you've got a five minute mm -hmm. walk. Mm -hmm. okay. Can okay. I maybe ask um, Simone on Alexander's behalf, do you think there was enough partnership working, I think was the question, so like between health, between housing, yeah. between um, social work? I don't think, like, so I live in the same place as Saffron in support accommodation and I get moved for my own safety, so for example my social worker and police organised a meeting with the support accommodation to be like what exact, like what happened and like they didn't even turn up for the meeting and we were sitting there for like 30 minutes like why they're not here and I was like, like well, I don't know. The same way, so I get moved out there and get put in a, another overly house in Clarkston, like a hostel thing, and that I get diagnosed with depression and anxiety and I, they were trying, the doctors were trying to get me counselling for my mental health, and, but I wasn't allowed on the waiting list because I had no permanent address. And to me, like homelessness people are probably the most vulnerable with high statistics of mental health, but you're not allowed to be on a waiting list because you don't have like a permanent address. Like, I don't think that's right. So okay. I personally don't think they all have good partnership, but I suppose everyone has different opinions. I think Jenny Goodruth was catching my eye there. Yeah, you, convener. Just on that uh, partnership point, um, I've met previously with Who Care Scotland and some care experienced young people uh, with other MSPs, and there seems to be a disconnect between school uh, going forward as care experienced young people. Now, obviously, I, I used to be a teacher before I was elected, and it seems to me that it would be a good opportunity for schools to signpost folk to the right places, especially care experienced young people. And if you're vulnerable and you, you are as a care experienced young person, then the school could perhaps be more, I don't know, forthcoming in terms of looking after you and, and making sure that, you know, you were provided accommodation. Was that anyone's experience here whose care experience? Did the school help in terms of homelessness? Did they support you? What was their role? I'm going to ask Simone to answer that and then I'll move on with the yeah. original question, but also bearing that question in mind. Not when I was homeless because the new legislation, Children and Young People Scotland Act went out, but right now, because of the acts came out, like all local authorities have signed up to be corporate, no, all schools have signed up to be corporate parents. So in now, in every school, there's a care experience, like professional that will link in with all care experienced people in the school to help them in now different situations, I think, which is quite good. But at that time, that wasn't for me personally. Thanks, Simone. I'm conscious Julie McCalla had mentioned the problems with your children in different schools, but so could you maybe tell us a bit more about that, but also bear in mind the original question, which was, what could change to make a difference to perhaps the situation that you were in? Well, I just feel when kids are at a school and the family breaks down, it's hard enough for them. Never mind getting moved about to the other side of the city, put in temporary accommodation to be left there for a wee while and get settled in a school again just to get moved. And 11 times is just too much for the brains to put up with. Uh, my 17 year old daughter, she's in the homeless and her schools took nothing to do with her. They've just said she's 17, she's of that age. Because she never came through care, because I kept her and she came through homeless with me. So but I was never taught. Look, when I was with my partner, he ran everything in the house. He paid bills. He done all that, so I didn't know. When we split up, he kept the house and I had to leave with my four daughters, and I didn't know how to run a house. And I'm 44 now, and I've still not had any support in that area. I've just come out of homeless, I've just come out of support accommodation, got my own flat, and I was supposed to get support workers coming in. I've never seen anybody, and I've been there a year and a half. And was there any option of you staying in the house with your children? Was that explored at all, or did you feel you had to leave? Well, my children, no, I couldn't stay in the home, my partner's home, no. I fled violence for him, mm -hmm. and that's how I ended up going through homeless. And what, I mean, I don't want them to ask, answer questions obviously they're not comfortable with. I should say that at the beginning. So if anybody isn't comfortable with any lines of questioning, please make that clear and don't feel you have to answer. 
what what would have been the solution then for you? Would it have been into a house if, straight away? They ask if you've got a local connection, but they don't take into consideration the kids' school and where they're settled. Right. Like, you need a local connection to get a house there, but it doesn't matter if your wing goes to school there. You still are going to go and get a house. They'll put you wherever they've got a flat. So they don't count children's schooling as a local no, connection? No, they don't count education. And I think that's a big thing, because it's affected my daughters all through their life. Mm-hmm. Because none of them have got an education. They're all grown women now with their own kids, and they never go to any education. They've had to go back to college and university after school. OK. Um, do I wish to follow up on that just now before I move on to ask Thomas Lyon the original question? No. So I wondered, the original question, as you know, is what from um, from my colleague, Graeme Simpson, was what, what could change, what changes would you like to see that would make a difference to what you went through? Well, I start, the reason I became homeless was because my, I had a private letter at the time, the council were paying for it, my landlord went bankrupt, and I didn't know anything about the homeless situation then. This was like nearly 10 years ago. Nothing, and so then I went to Hamish Harlan, I didn't know about shelter. I didn't know, I think, probably starting at me personally, I think it should start at the DWP, because I dare say 95% of people that are homeless are on benefits. I think that they should have some, there should be some sort of information in there. No, for people, I went, I went to the brew, and then the next minute I know I'm sleeping under a bridge with a jacket. I didn't know anything about the street team, you can go and get a sleeping bag. I didn't know anything about shelter for my rights. I didn't know anything about that, and I spent, I was in every hostel in Glasgow four or five times each. And it's like silly reasons you get put at them. It was not for violence or anything like that. It was like the, the, the curfew is 12 o'clock at night. I was turning up at 20 past 12 and getting put back in the street. I think that's a joke. And I was, I was same as Reese. I was in my son's life right up to he was 10. And I never seen him through that six and a half years till he was 17. And where, during all that hostel time, I ended up with a drug and alcohol addiction. Both of them. And I ended up, that's, that's where I was there. I was in a rehab centre. That was the institution I was talking about. And But when I got put in that flat on where I was, again, about a lot of violence and things like that. So I went into the rehab to kind of escape it. I told my care manager, I told my housing officer, I told the casework team, and they all just said to me, too bad, you caused it, you're going back home to there. And I went to the MSP Bill Kid for Knightswood and that, and that's where I was. And he sent a letter to David Williams, head of health and social care. He sent a letter back to the casework team. But I got put in a, from relieving that rehab, I got put in a hostel where everybody was using. I've just spent six months cleaning my act up. I'm walking, stepping over people in the hostel that are like that. And I had to spend three weeks in there. And I was actually going to, to spend a lot, but if it wasn't for uh, MSP Bill Kidd sending a letter up to David Williams and him sending a letter back to the casework team. And then I went into shelter and they told me that I, I went to the casework team and they were supposed to do an investigation because I was fleeing violence and they never done it. And shelter basically got, gave, got, gave me my rights. I contacted them back through shelter and they basically says they'll sit down with me. But then they get the letter off David Williams and through shelter on David Williams, I got put into an abstinence based support accommodation where I'm the new. But I think I really do think that there should be more information out there. Because I was just in a flat and then just suddenly I got the high court officers at the door with a writ. You have to be out in seven days. And that was me out in the street and I didn't know enough. My mother stays in London, my brother stays in Ireland, so that's my family connection. And I wasn't going to phone them and say, oh, I'm on the street. So I ended up under bridges and this and that. And then I got a thing called I went to the legal service advisory, the legal service agency in Glasgow, because I was getting nowhere. I wasn't even getting a hostel after a while. I was getting two bus tokens at Hamish Allen Centre and see you later. And that's it for years. I went to the legal service agency. Eh? Sorry, I'm just hearing everything and I'm getting really agitated because I'm like really wanting to say something, but I just don't know when the right time is. Yeah, I was going to just bring you in actually. Sorry. Just now. So well, can I ask Thomas if he wants to just finish um, uh, off at that and they told me what the Hamish Allen were doing with me it was illegal they had me barred from hostels I'd never even been in and called it DNA do not accommodate and I don't know why some so. of my colleagues might want to come back and mm-hmm. have some questions about that but I'll bring Emma in at this point the original question just to remind you because could you, could you ask it again uh, the original question oh. was um, from Graham, who's sitting next to you was uh, what so what changes would you, you like to see that might have made a difference to your situation okay, or well, anything else you want to add? Before I go into the changes, I would need to kind of go into detail about my homeless experience. So my homeless experience probably starts way back from when I was a little girl. 
When I moved up to Dundee from London with my mum, I left my dad's care. Obviously, my family broke down. I moved up to Dundee with my mum. We were in the homeless hostels for, I would say, for mum went through the homeless hostels, she went through the women's aid. So I remember it all. I remember all, I remember all the experiences that I've had in the hostels. I remember what they were like. And now I'm older. I've been through the care, I've been through care, I've been through foster care. I was in three different foster placements. I've left all my foster placements. And now even the case of, it all ties in about being homeless because at the end of the day, Although I've been in all these places, I've stayed with all these families that have had all these things in their houses, they've had the perfect family, they've had these perfect family settings. You come away from it at a certain age, and yet you don't get to speak to them. You don't see them at all. Do you know what I mean? You don't see any of them. So then you're left there like, well, at the end of the day, I've been left with no home from the age of seven years old, technically. I left my home at seven years old and I've been pushing and pushing and pushing through, doing all that I can. I've worked for Who Cares Scotland, I'm an ex worker for Who Cares Scotland, I've done the Champions Board, but yet still there is still no, I feel like there's still no change. I left Who Cares Scotland last year, things started to go really wrong for me, my, my, my life was starting to spiral out of control because I had blocked things up for so many years that I've not been able to get out because of the amount, because of the care that hasn't been provided to me because of discrimination that I have, that, but that I have realised that I haven't been able to understand as I grew up. And now today is the chance where I've just managed to gather it all in my head and today has just been the point where I'm like, I need to get all this out because it's going to end up coming to breaking point and I'm going to end up maybe being in Thomas' situation where I'm going to get aggressive, I'm going to end up taking drugs. I've, been, I've seen it. I've seen drugs. I've been through it. Not, not, I've not been through it personally. I've seen it within my family. I know how much effect it has and I just think that there's so much things that need to be brought together to change the homeless experience that you can't even talk about. But you can't even talk about changing the homeless experience without thinking about everything else that's involved around it, like care plans that don't get sought, that, that, that don't get followed for the continuing for the for, for for people growing up. They don't get they don't they don't they don't get looked at properly. They just get left. Do you know what I mean? And then you've got people that are just left to just think, like, well, where does that leave me? Where's my place in the world? Everybody's got everybody's got a, a point in the world. Do you know what I mean? And you think, what, what, where's 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 where is where is the where is the Sorry, I'm losing track of what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm really sorry. So what, what, Graham, what sorry, can you, I, Graham sorry. Simpson. Yeah. What, what would you change? Given I'd probably Simpson change did, the fact that, change? That, that there needs to be more support within an actual family. With rather than being families split up, left, right and centre, fair enough, maybe the parents are doing something <coughs> wrong, but they need, to be, they need to be kept together. Families need to be kept together. Because at the end of the day, you're going through these homeless hostels. You don't know the next. You don't know the. You don't know this person from the next person. But you, you still speak to them, because you think, well, what else is there to do? What else is there to do in these hostels? What else can you do? What is it possible to do when you're in a when you're, you're in a state in your mind when you're homeless? You think, mm. I've, I, I could, I've got I've got so much potential, but there's there, yet yeah, there's no support. You want to access the support, but you're like, I don't. You don't know how to do it. You don't know how to get there. You, there's just something blocking you when you're in these hostels, and you just feel like you just can't do anything. You can't do anything. And it's, it doesn't help that the staff and the horses, they're meant to help you, but they don't. They don't help you. And that's the sad reality of it. They don't. They help you to an extent that they can, but the help that, that, that you actually need to get through your homeless experience, it's not there. That's all I've got Thanks to say. very much. Um, and, you know, for us as a committee, this is what we obviously want to hear because we're taking forward this inquiry and these are exactly the, the experiences from you all that, that we need to know about because it's all very well us sitting, taking evidence from... Um, local authorities, etc. But it's very, very, very important that, that we hear what the reality is on the ground. On Certainly, Rhys, you yeah. could. Right. I, I know Emma, and I know the situation she's in and where she's at, right? Now, but she's in, in the Salvation Army, I feel that her, in general, right, is in a very wrong environment, right, because of the way she is, right, the person she is, what she's involved in and everything is not nowhere near the level of what these people are involved in. I don't think the, the seriousness of the Salvation Army has hit quite home to where how bad this is. You know what I mean? How wrong this could go for you, how quickly it could go wrong for you. I've seen it happen so many times. But then that's just the thing, it's just, it's just lucky that I'm strong enough to know well, where my barriers are and where, 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 where my yeah. loyalties lie, do you know what I mean? I would never ever turn to the side where I want to just ruin my life or do anything like that. That's not the case because I'm strong enough to do that. I've managed to hold so much together over the years and I've got to this point now. And I'm not just talking for myself to be selfish, but yeah, it comes with, it comes with that care experience background and owning your identity 
you know, and understanding the person that you are and not be, not feeling ashamed or not feeling bad about the fact that, yeah, you have had a, a, a terrible upbringing or you have had to go through these things at the end of the day, you're still standing there, you're still there, you still wanting to make a change. But then, Emma, would it be um, so much better for you if you had a secure tenancy with the support you need round about that? Yeah, I've had, I've had two houses before myself, but they've, they've packed in because it's just never been the right time for me. And I have had support in the past, but everything that I've done, that I've realised that I've done in the past, recently or whatever, it's all just been total jumbled about. Like I left school at 15, I went away to college, I got, got, a couple of, got a couple of qualifications, I went into a job, I left that, I went into another job, left that, another job. I was just, just doing anything that I could just to take my mind off of the fact that... Pff, I've not, I've got no place in this world, do you know what I mean? I, well, that's what I think, I've got no place. I was born in London, do you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, I've still got a part of me that's missing that I don't know who that part is. Because there's been things that have happened to me throughout my life that I've had to, I've had to, I've had to be put under the looked after, the, the, the looked after branch. I've had to come away from the care of my mum. I've had to, I've, I've, had, I've had to come away from the fact that my mum has went through years of being given a terrible service from however many people. I've had to, serve, I've, I've had to come through the fact that I lost contact with my dad for 15 years, and yet I'm living with all these other people. That comes under the bracket of being homeless. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter just whether you're living on the streets or whether you're living in a hostel. If you're not in your family placement with your primary carers from a point until you feel like you can have them, then that's it. That's you being homeless. Yeah, thanks very much, Emma. Naturally, that takes us back to maybe something Thomas said that I think, a lot, you know, there are people on benefits that become homeless and that can maybe be difficult, but there are lots of other reasons um, for people to become homeless. There are lots of situations where people are homeless um, and people might be sofa surfing, living with friends. They might have lost jobs there for lose mortgages even. So, you know, it can be lots of different <laughs> circumstances for people to become homeless. I'm going to bring Thomas back in. I was, I was in my flat. My flat was fine. It was my landlord that went bankrupt. That's how I got made homeless. It wasn't through any reason. My rent was getting paid. Everything was all fine. But when I got made homeless, I, couldn't, I wouldn't contact my mother in London and give her the worries about me being home. Or my brother in Ireland. They're, they've got, they're happy in their life. So I was left in the street like, what did I do? You know what I mean? I go down to the brew and they just say, blah, blah, blah. I say I'm homeless. They tell me, I've got to change my doctor to Hunter Street because I'm a homeless doctor. I've got to, it's every, I've got to get my, my, my methadone at the time. When, once I end up on all that, you have to go to your homeless mob. Once you get in, then you go from hostel to hostel. And then you're having to try and change your address. And then getting flung out of hostels for just coming in at 20 past 12 and the pouring down rain. I think that's a joke. You no, know, just, no, door shut. Yes. Too bad, you know the curfew. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I need to just. If you're not in for one o'clock, and then you come in, you've Recent got CCTV minute. cameras hounding you everywhere, and you're like, I meant to be living here, I meant to pay rent to live here, but you've got cameras following me about, like we're in Big Brother. No, I don't think so. Do you Thanks. know what I mean? I think we want to hear from everybody, and it's important that we do, and it's good that you all feel that you can come in. But our official <coughs> report has to be able to. I need to take people one at a time because I feel, I feel our official that in report the, house, uh, it. the housing situation, and I think there should be people in there with lived experience. Mm -hmm. Because, see, personally, I wouldn't be in the place I'm in without Julie being there with lived experience. She took me to the casework team, she fought for my rights for me through shelter, but she's got a lived experience, so I took to her, if you know what I mean, right away. We kind of clicked and I listened to her because she's. And I just feel that pe people are more understanding me. I lived experience. I mean, somebody that's lived experience, she's the volunteer that helped me for shelter, that took me to the casework team, that, that told them about my rights. And then I ended up getting where I am through shelter and obviously the MSP bill kid. But I think there should be people in the housing who lived experience. You no, know, just rather than just they've been through college and textbook, whatever. You no, know, there should be lived experience. I think that and takes us back to maybe Alexander Stewart's point about trying to get everybody working together in partnerships, etc. Can I ask my colleagues if there's any additional questions? Because we had Graham Simpson's original question and we have you know we have explored that quite thoroughly, I think. Andy Whiteman, please. Uh, thanks, Kevin, and thanks everyone for coming and giving your experience this morning. Um, I just want to put on the record that, that I think your experience, Thomas, I don't think anyone should be evicted just because their landlord goes bankrupt. I mean, that's the inadequacy of our uh, rental laws. Um, sure. Um, I just want to ask a question about the role of charities and voluntary organisations working in homelessness on the one hand and councils and their legal obligations and duties um, on the other. Could you tell us a little bit about what your experience is of those two different, very different sectors and um, um, you know, if you believe that one sector is doing particularly well or particularly badly, you know, how that might be 
changed? In other, in other words, is it is it have, have in particular have voluntary organisations been critical in helping you with the issues you've faced, or has it been more the council and their statutory obligations that have helped you? Emma, you you staying in a, I understand you're with a voluntary organisation. That's where your accommodation yeah, is the just now. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And you've been in tenancies before, did you say? Was uh, that local authority tenancies? That was local authority. Uh -huh. That was um, with support with through care after care. Right. Do you want to maybe? think about Andy's question then and uh -huh. what you think the differences are? Um, well, I would have to say that obviously I've started to access uh, support with Sheller for what, the past couple of months, Lisa. For the past couple of months, but I, I first accessed the support last year. Um, but Shelter have been like really good with me. Like I've been, I've helping, been doing stuff with them, and they're now helping me look at, look for a flat just now, whilst I'm in the Salvation Army. But before I did have my two tenancies with the council, um, but. At that point, I was leaving. I had left care, and I was starting to rebel like really bad. Like when I was in my supported lodgings placement, and I was like, I want my own house. I want to get away. I just want my own space because obviously I didn't. I didn't feel like I. I, I didn't feel like I belonged in any of these families that I've stayed with that I've mentioned before. So I just wanted to be on my own, and I thought being on my own was the, the only the best option. I got my first flat, accumulated rent arrears because I was at college and I was working, but with the council, like that flat was great. But. The only thing that I would have to say that I was unhappy about was the fact that I got given an antisocial behaviour order for four years through noise and like partying and things, which I understand I made that mistake myself, like I shouldn't have had that, but I felt that it wasn't dealt with in the right way that it should have been. Like I was offering to do remediation for the, the neighbour down the stair, uh, the women that worked with the, the ASBO team within the council. I don't mean to be rude, but she was a complete BITCH. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but she was. And now I could have said that, but I didn't want to say it in here because obviously we're what are. But she was, right? And I know you're laughing and I shouldn't be saying that, but like she totally, it's like she totally had, had like a vendetta for me. And she just, she was, she, no matter what I said, it was not, you're getting your four year ASBO and that's it. So I would have to say that getting my houses through the council haven't been good. My experience with the council hasn't been good, even with previous experience with my mum. And now that's talking like, two decades ago, even still. So I've got all this from the council. So what was the conversation? What was the question again? I think it's just, um, okay. and, and I don't think we were laughing as such, Emma, it's just that we do need to be careful because we're so on camera <laughs> in this. So the question was really about whether or not, the time, aye, if, there was different, if there was different experiences between sort of the, the voluntary sector, the local authority, but it seems from what you're saying. I'm still that, kind of just getting a mix of it all, do you know what I mean, like the council, but with the access and shelter, like I've been doing well with shelter, like they, mm -hmm. uh, the support that I've had from shelter has probably been more support than I got with Who Cares Scotland, working with them for three years, and I've only just accessed support from shelter. I think the point year. maybe we would get as well from what you said is it was it was good to get a house, but then there was the support that it came just, with that was uh -huh. and it was also conflicting. So on the one hand, uh -huh. the council was appearing because they Emma were was giving you a well house, and I was doing well at that point, and I was at college and I was working. Yeah. That all, everything behind that wasn't looked at. Uh -huh. So the more support health, within the house. Or the support yeah. within the house, or keeping on top of budgeting, yeah. or this or that. So now I've accumulated, I'm like yourself, Saffron, I've accumulated mm -hmm. rent arrears. You've managed to pay yours off. I'm still in rent arrears. Okay, maybe we could ask Saffron on, on the mm -hmm. question that Andy Whiteman asked about the differences between um, local authority provision and voluntary sector provision. Um, I think that would be sort of dependent on who you asked and where they came from. In my experience working with young people from at least 10 or 11 different local authorities across Scotland, it is very much a postcode lottery, the care provision that you get and the aftercare support you get. Um, myself and Simone have been really lucky in terms of sort of through care and aftercare support. Um, my experience with social services was terrible. If anything, they made my life significantly worse. They didn't improve it. Um, and I think in terms of like the the voluntary and the local authorities. I think the local authority was, was good to give me a flat and supported accommodation, but that wasn't supportive. I almost went bankrupt at the age of 18 and still have an awful credit rating, which I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of. Um, I think there are pockets of good practice, though, within different local authorities and different teams and different agencies. Like, I've met young people that have worked with us at the Hamish Allen Centre, but had a really, really awful experience of that. And then other people that have gone through sort of charities and stuff and had a positive experience but I think because especially in terms of local authorities there's no 
accountability. There's no one that investigates all the bad practice or the third se- like in the third sector or within the local authorities. So no one's held accountable. So you've got this kid experience back. Yeah, but then you're like, well, yeah, I'm a kid experience, but let's just throw it out to the world without any other support underlying it. Do you know what I mean? You're just like, well, here's me and here's my life, here's my story. I think that's you know that's something important for us to hear. Um, Andy Whiteman, did you want to specifically ask that question to anyone else? If anyone else wishes to come back, I'm fine. Otherwise, we can move on. Yeah, Rhys Campbell. Come back. Yeah, Rhys yeah. Campbell first, local then followed authority, by Thomas Lang. Local authority, in my opinion, local authority is really, really poor. My housing officer has sort of more holidays than Santa Claus, in honesty. Uh, every time I phone for her, she either works two days a week and she finishes at 12. So I try to get her on certain days and I can't get her. I've had housing applications that have been suspended because I've asked for this right at the time and then when I'm getting told I've got like maybe a 28 days notice thing to move from this support of the accommodation because something had happened there <coughs> well, I was promised to have <coughs> something put in place because I'd been homeless for two years and I'm top of their list to get housed right so they're telling me basically when yeah, they've been misleading you for a while for a long time first yeah first on the list for here yeah, 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 phones, then he's third on the list they're telling me the girl says to me <coughs> right Reese. It's been over a year since I've seen you. You look a hundred times better. You're a lot better than what I expected to see. I would put you forward for a tenancy or a supported tenancy. I'm telling you, I'd be happy to take either. Right? She says, right, what we'll do then is, at the time before I knew I had the 28 days notice thing, I said to her, what I would rather do is investigate all possible opportunities because you're only giving me one offer. Because I'm homeless, I only got one offer. You're aware of that, yes? Yes. Right, so it's not like whatever I get chosen, that's what I've got to take. Unlike anyone off the street that gets a choice, yeah? Up to three offers. So anyway, I says to her, right, I want to investigate all available opportunities to make sure I'm making the right decision so that I keep myself safe and put myself in a safe environment so that wherever I go, I'm giving myself the best advantage, best advantage to keep myself safe. Oh, so. uh, whatever. <laughs> Uh, Rhys, can I, can I just check something with you? So if you only had the one, that was only the one housing officer, so if that person wasn't there, there was no one else you could uh, well, go to? I asked and asked and asked, right? But because the housing officer eventually come out to see me in my, in my support of the accommodation, right? Because they were sort of ushering me. They were saying to me, I've been here a year, I'd progressed so far, and I've almost sat stagnant is what they said. You could come to a point where you get so much better or you could fall backwards, which I could agree, right? So I pulled the housing officer up. She came up eventually. We went through my housing application, which at the time when I took it out, I was just made homeless. So at the time when I took that housing application, uh, I ticked every box under the sun. Yeah, I did, because I was <coughs> in a position where I was just made homeless. And I thought, I'll just tick it out. I need a house, you know? so. I ticked everything anyway, so it looked like it was time to get this sorted out. I said, so bring her down, we'll go through my housing application, I'll go through all the areas to where I would be happy to go and where it'd be safe to go. We agreed on, like, maybe certain sec- certain areas, taking certain streaks off certain areas. Happy with that. Now she said, we will also investigate for the likes positive steps, new pathways, all these other organisations. Quite happy to do that. I says, well, we'll do that before we put my housing application live. Because once my housing application is live, she told me the following day, she could contact me and tell me exactly where I'd be on the list. Right? Anyway. I think I need to hurry up a wee bit because uh, we're well, actually running out of time, sorry, believe it or not. Well, you're asking me questions, so I'm trying <laughs> to give you an answer. And... I just need to try and keep it moving slightly because yeah, actually well, we're well, over well, time. Basically, I mean, they wouldn't have helped because I'd asked for support of the because I said I was interested in support of the accommodation and she'd went off on her jollies or her time off, whatever. Her manager, right, of Dundee Council was not willing to put my housing application live because I had said I was wanting to look at support of the accommodation first. But because she hadn't put on the notes that she was willing to give me a tenancy straight away. I was stuck practically with a noose around my neck, waiting on 28 days to fall, to come out into nothing, in the support of the accommodation, right? And then when I get given, when I'm told my housing application started live, I'm number one for a house in Minas Hill, 
I went, and she told me, you, be, you, be two days before you get out. Undoubtedly, I could tell you. That's what she was saying. That's because the turnaround's 24 houses per month, right? That's what she was telling me. Mm -hmm. Be top of the list for a house. Still not. No. No. So I do have to apologise because we are very limited for time, and I think what what we now know is that we could have had longer, much longer for this session. Maybe it's something that we need to revisit. Um, I'm going. We are though going to have a more informal session afterwards, but I'm going to bring Thomas Lyon in and then ask committee <coughs> members if they have final questions that I could put to everyone. Thomas? Well, well, as I said, when I was homeless and I'd done all the hostels, eventually I got barred. For, well, they, they just kept saying there was no, no place for me in the hostels. And as, as Rhys was saying there, my casework team, I used to go in there at quarter to nine in the morning for opening and just go in there and lie across the chairs for, for a heat with my sleeping bag. And I'd lie there, my, my housing officer would come and see me, and then she would come back to me at quarter to five that night, because that's the only time you can present at Hamish Allen. So she'd say quarter to five when they were closing, there's nowhere for you, and this went on for years. And then eventually, as I said, I had to go to the legal service. Well, I gave their card, and I went to see them, and they said, he was sending an email, I says, what are you doing? And they're a lawyer, and he went, I'm, I'm sending an email threatening to sue the district council lawyers in your name, because it's illegal what they're doing to you. And then I went down to him. I told me presented to him Michelle, and then I went down and presented. I went, I went, I went, I know you, Thomas. I know it. Took me into a room, put me up in a hotel for three nights, and then put me in a, sorry, put me in a hotel for five nights, three nights in one hotel, the Ibis Hotel, and two nights in the Clifton Hotel. And then the sixth day, I got a flat. And I says to that, that lawyer for the legal service, "Could I have done this six months ago?" He says, "You could have done it six years ago." He says, "Illegal what they're doing to you." And then that's why I've ended up through all my homelessness. I've been through shelter. I've been through legal service advisors. I've been through MPs. I've had to really, really fight to get any supported accommodation. So I mean, just to get any supported accommodation, I've had to fight. Does that. It, this is the kind of thing that we do need to hear. Do any of the committee members have a further specific question before I ask um, our guests to just say a final thing that they might want to add on the record before we, we maybe have a more private chat after. Andy Whiteman. I, I just want to follow up my question on Saffron's response there about identifying the fact that, of course, local authorities can be held accountable for what they do, whereas sometimes the voluntary sector can't. And I think we should return to that perhaps later, because I think there's issues there given the extent to which the voluntary sector is being expected actually to fill in a lot of gaps and actually also to provide services. Thanks. Just check with other committee members. Ken Gibson, you okay? okay thanks, Jenny yeah. Goodruth. Um, Alexander. Bob Doris. Thanks, Convener. Um, it's really just an excuse to apologise for being late as much as anything, but I, I do, I, I, a comment, and if, you know, if, if witnesses want to kind of, uh, make a remark on this when, when hopefully you get the last word, then it would just be that one of the things we're looking at as a committee is the whole kind of stepping stone process to giving somebody a tenancy. So maybe you're rough sleeping and then maybe you're in a hostel and then maybe you're in temporary accommodation and then maybe you're in some kind of conditional tenancy, and then maybe you get a, a full tenancy, and that's your flat, that, 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 that's your home, what you were saying, Rhys. And we're kind of looking at, would it be a lot more straightforward to say to someone at that really early stage, this is your tenancy, and here's the four or five people that will give you the support you require to keep that tenancy, because we're not trying to pretend that you suddenly get a tenancy and everything in your life is a rosy. That's not how it works. We know that's not how it works, but I suppose what I'm asking, if each of you were to be given a mainstream tenancy, so Housing Association Council, that's your flat, what kind of supports would you need when you got that flat to help you keep that tenancy? Because there's no point in giving you it and then two, three months down the line you find yourself been, been evicted or you give it up because there's some kind of crisis moment in your life or whatever. So what we're trying to look at is not just getting you the house, although that would be really, really nice, it's making sure that once you get it, what supports we can provide to give you a fighting chance of keeping it as well. And if you could answer that. It's the time, it comes down to the time and resources for the staff, for the staff to get for the, to give support to this said person that's got this tenancy. It always comes down to the time. That's the excuse. It's Thanks, Emma. I'm, I'm going to start on the right here, and if you bear Bob's question, if you want to add anything else, if you bear Bob Dodd's question in mind, could you just say some final words that you want to put on the record today, because we do need to draw this formal bit of the meeting to a close. So, Simone, could we start? Yeah, uh, like for Paul's question, I think like we should get support in life skills. Like I remember moving into my first tenancy, and like I didn't know how to like boil an egg or something like stupidly like that or iron. Like 
or tax, like I knew nothing about tax or budget, and so like so the smallest things can make a difference and stuff. I would think. Okay, is there anything else you want to say to the committee on the record? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. I know how to live, I know how to cook, I know how to clean, I know how to pay my rent. I've been to people on my hands and knees begging for support of the accommodation, saying, you know, I'll follow any rules, I'll stick to anything you want to offer. I'm putting enough work as it is to get where I'm at here. I'm asking you on my hands and knees for support of the accommodation. And I'm still in the same situation. I'm willing to follow any rules, any implement, three hours a week, three times a week, whatever you want, I'll go with that. And I cannot say any clearer than that. That that's uh, I'll go with whatever rules people are wanting. I'll I'll stick by. You said, do you want to say a final word about anything else for the committee for on the uh, record? I just hope I get sorted out soon. Eh? Thanks very much, Emma. Uh, I would probably just like to probably add like uh, for somebody like having a tenancy, like giving them support for stuff that you might not see, like as in mental health. Do you know what I mean? So just make making sure, or maybe like at least letting that person access extra support when it comes to maybe like phoning somebody like at any time of the day or night, like, oh my God, there's something that's going on in my house or I'm feeling a bit low or someone, someone just, somebody there that's just that like one-stop shop person that's kind of Mr. Not All, but not Mr. Not All, but like there, if you know what I mean, like for anything, just make it simple. Thanks very much. Uh, Julie? Thank you for coming. <laughs> Julie? I think when people come out to support accommodation, like, when I came out to support accommodation, I had nothing to keep start a house up. Uh, I was gave my white goods and just put into a flat, bare flares, bare windies, and because I had a fridge and a cooker, I was supposed to live in it. And I know a lot of people that came through the same support accommodation with me, and they've just went right, right back round the circle because I've not any support and doing any of that stuff, and they're back in the same accommodation again had to go back through treatment another six months and a couple of them have even died because I've been left in a flat with no life skills, told that they're going to get support <coughs> and nobody even appears at your door. So you're just left to it really as an adult, still feeling like a teenager, no knowing how to live. You're just left to get on with it. Thanks, Julie. Is there anything else and any other issue that you feel... You wanted to put on the record and you haven't had the chance to? I just think when the council say they're going to support you in a tenancy, they should stick with it. They sh there should be something there to say when you sign a tenancy, that they should be signing something they're not saying that they're going to go through with what they've promised. Thanks very much. Thomas? Uh, as I say, when I come through all the homelessness and I, get, I, I went to the legal, advisors, legal service agency, what happened was I got put up in the hotel. The Hamish Allen gave me a thing to take to a hotel. I got put up in that hotel for five nights. Never spoke to another person. I got told on the sixth day from my casework team to go to a flat. Went to the flat. There was a guy there with one sheet of paper. That was my tenancy agreement. Sign there. See you later. And I, I had a drug and alcohol problem. I, I had problems in that area and everything. I just took it because it was off the street. And, I just, and that was it. And I was just left on that flat. That's it. There you go. Temp furnished flat. See ya. I was in there for 18 months. <laughs> and I just couldn't get it together. And I really think that there should be like, the follow-up care. And I think there should be people... I really do have some strong about this. So there should be people with lived experience to follow up with care, because you're going to take to somebody... See, to be honest, homelessness is homelessness. Drug addiction is drug addiction. No, it's, it's kind of right across... No, if it's to be a specific person. I could probably relate to Reese. Reese could probably relate to me. Relate to, I mean, the homelessness is homelessness. I mean, we've all got lived experience, but it's all similar when it comes right round to the thing. And I think, personally, people with lived experience, like Julie helped me, that really, really worked for me. And I think, well, personally, it would work for me. It worked for me, so I think it worked for others. OK, thanks, Thomas. And um, Xafra? Um, <coughs> obviously, being representative of Care Experience Young People today, I think that there needs to be more specific resources and accommodation allocated to that group. Um, more support in terms of mental health services and addiction issues and things like that. Um, it's like some of the people have been saying, it's like if you have a drug and alcohol problem, but they want you to fix that before they give you a tenancy, how would you be able to sort out your mental health and drug and alcohol and addiction issues when you don't even have a safe or secure home or environment to be in to do that? <laughs> mm. So it's 
What about moving into the, the tenancy um, that Bob Doris mentioned? Do you think then? I think that's a really, really good idea. I think as long as there were people in place, even vol on a voluntary basis, um, people like us that would go and support them with life skills, with managing money. I think access to mental health services is a really, really big thing. I think I went through quite a difficult stage when I was maybe about 17 and I almost like sort of ended up ruining my flat because of that, but I didn't have access to any support because it wasn't severe enough um, for me to qualify for it. Much. Um, I think we could have been here for another hour, another hour but sadly um, in Parliament we just can't, aren't able to do that in the formal session. So can I thank everybody for coming along, sharing your experiences with us. I'm sure there are more things you'd like to say to us and we can maybe do that after the meeting. But right now can I close this meeting of the committee. Thank you all very much.